Chapter One of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter One Woman's Ideal Man. I suppose there was never yet a woman who had not somewhere set up on a pedestal in her brain an ideal of manhood. He is by no means immutable, this paragon. On the contrary, he changes very often. If, however, the woman whose ideal he is grows upward in every way as she grows older, then these changes all go to improve him and by the time he is finished he is a very fine creature he never is finished till the brain of his creator ceases to work till she has added her last touch to him and has laid down the burden of life and gone elsewhere perhaps to some happy land where ideals are more frequently realized than ever happens here like every other woman i have my ideal of manhood the difficulty is to describe it first of all he must be a gentleman but that means so much that it in its turn requires explanation gentleness and moral strength combined must be the salient characteristics of the gentleman together with that polish that is never acquired but in one way constant association with those so happily placed that they have enjoyed the influences of education and refinement all through their lives he must be thoughtful for others kind to women and children and all helpless things tender-hearted to the old and the poor and the unhappy but never foolishly weak in giving where gifts do harm instead of good his brain must be as fine as his heart in fact there are few such men but they do exist i know one or two reliable as rocks judicious in every action dependable in trifles as well as the large affairs of life full of mercy and kindness to others affectionate and well loved in their homes their lives are pure and kindly it was once said by a clever man that no one could be a gentleman all round who had not knocked about the world and associated with all sorts and conditions of men high and low rich and poor good and bad experiences like these are like the processes for refining gold the man who emerges unharmed from the fire of poverty and its associations and who retains his independent manliness in relations with those high placed must have within him a fibre of strength that is the true essence of manliness so many alas go down down when pertheth cold touches them with her terrible chilly finger and so many become obsequious and subservient false to themselves in dealing with those above them well my ideal does neither he is always true to himself and cannot then be false to any man and he must have a sense of humour too otherwise he would be far from perfect how life is brightened by a sense of fun think of what breakfast lunch and dinner would be if all were to be as solemn and as serious as some folk would have it if good manners are not practised at home but are allowed to lie by until occasion calls upon their wearer to assume them they are sure to be a bad fit when donned it may be a trifle of the smallest to acquire a habit of saying if you please and thank you readily but it is no trifling defect in a young man to fail to do so if he does not jump up to open the door for his mother or sister he may omit to do so some day when the neglect will tell against him in the estimation of those to please whom he would gladly give much carelessness in dress and personal appearance amount to bad manners in the home there is sometimes a disagreeable negligence in this respect at the breakfast-table unkempt hair untended finger-nails and a far from immaculate collar are occasionally to be seen 
especially on latecomers who do not practice the ingratiating politeness of punctuality lounging untidy habits are another form of bad manners the ill-bred young man smokes all over the house upstairs and downstairs and even in his mother's drawing-room he may be traced from room to room by the litter of newspapers and magazines he leaves behind him the present fashion of taking one's reading in pills so to speak snatching it in scrappy paragraphs from weekly miscellanies is but too favourable to this lack of order in this young man's own room there is chaos the maids have endless trouble in clearing up after him his tobacco is spilled over tables chairs and carpets his handkerchiefs ties socks and collars are lying about in every corner of the room he is too indolent even to put his boots outside the door at night that they may be cleaned in the morning to save himself trouble he bangs all the doors instead of gently latching them and yet perhaps if he could but realize that all this is bad manners he would become as neat as he is now the reverse and would be as decorative at table as he is at the present moment unornamental it is not only young men whose standard of behaviour in the home is a low one masters of the house fathers of families men of middle age who are terribly put out if any one fails in duty to them are sometimes conspicuously ill-bred in everyday matters they are late for every meal to the discomfort of the other members of the family and the great inconvenience of the servants polite to the world outside they are brusque and disagreeable in their manner at home rough to the servants rude to their wives and irritable with their children sometimes a good heart and considerable family affection are hidden away behind all this but the families of such men would be very glad to compound for a little less affection and hidden goodness and rather more gentleness and outward polish apart from faults of temper men fall into careless habits of speech and manner at home and one form of this that is habitually using strong language in the presence of women and children is particularly offensive besides it defeats itself for if the forcible expressions are intended to express disapprobation they soon become weak and powerless to do so because they are used on every possible occasion after a time they lose all meaning i know a family where there are sons and daughters the latter charming and in every respect young gentlewomen but the sons fall far below their level they come to the door with thundering knocks that make every one in the house start disagreeably with surprise walk through the hall without introducing their muddy boots to either scraper or doormat sit down to meals without the usual preliminary of hand-washing and hair-brushing and are altogether rough and unpresentable if friends call at the house these young men rush away from the chance of encountering them or if they cannot help meeting them they blush scarlet look very gauche and uncomfortable and feel miserable they knock things over out of pure awkwardness and never realize that the secret of the whole matter is the want of self-training girls are animated by a greater wish to please an amiable desire that need not be confounded with vanity and this wish had led the sisters of these young men to practise those small acts of daily self-denial which after a while produce the highest self-culture so far as manners go what is the habitual neatness but constant coercion of human nature's innate indolence what is politeness in the home but the outcome of affection and self-respect and the suppression of all those natural instincts of self-seeking that allowed their way produce the worst manners in the world if any young man desires to be a perfect gentleman he must begin in his own home it is delightful to see some young men unobtrusively attentive to their sisters 
watchful of every need of their father and mother cheerful and pleasant in their manner full of fun and brightness yet never losing the gentleness that denotes the fine nature and so beloved in the home for all these endearing qualities that when they leave it they are sadly missed the father misses them for the pleasant companionship the sisters miss them for the boyish spirits and the exuberant fun that never exceeds the bounds of good taste and refinement and the mother misses them more than any one else for no one better than she knows how many times a day her boys have set aside their own wishes in deference to hers quietly silently unostentatiously in a word out of pure good manners in the deepest highest truest sense of the words such gentle virile natures look out at the world through the countenance which is a letter of recommendation to them wherever they go i have but faintly sketched my ideal the following pages may fill in the remaining touches many men who go out into the world while still very young to earn their living have few opportunities of acquiring a knowledge of social observances leaving home when boys at an age when they are utterly careless of such things as etiquette and the nice conduct of a cane they live in lodgings or at boarding-houses of the cheaper sort where the amenities of existence have to yield to its practicalities meals are served in a fashion that means despatch rather than elegance economy rather than taste and very few hints can be picked up for the guidance of young fellows when they enter the homes of friends and acquaintances their anxiety to fall in accurately and easily with the observances of those they meet on such occasions is as great as it is natural they know well that to fail in these trifling acts of omission and commission is tacitly to acknowledge that they are unversed in the ways of good society there is not necessarily any snobbishness in this a man may be perfectly manly and yet most unwilling to show himself inferior in any way to others of the class to which he belongs by birth and education even should those with whom he occasionally associates be his superiors is he not right to try to rise culture may mean little or nothing to the uncultured polish may be an empty word to the unpolished but they are realities and go far to produce an inward and corresponding refinement of mind and spirit there are thousands of young men in london alone at this very moment who are longing to acquire the ease and aplomb of good society the desire is worthy of all encouragement only those with real good in them can feel it the men who are destitute of it are those who associate with their inferiors contentedly accept a low moral standard adopt a mode of speech and action that is coarse and rough and finally let themselves down to the frequenting of public-houses and places of amusement where the entertainment has been carefully planned to suit the uneducated the low-born and others whose vitiated taste leads them to dislike what is lovely and of good report and to revel in the reverse but unfortunately many a good fellow has been driven to seek companionship with those beneath him by the very difficulty he experiences in getting on in society he fancies that his small solecisms are the subject of observation and comment and he suffers agonies of mauvaise honte girls often laugh very unkindly at shy youths when they might find opportunities of acting the good angel to them and by the exercise of tact screening from observation those failures in good manners which are inevitable to the inexperienced when he finds himself the butt of a few giggling girls a young man feels miserably uncomfortable and humiliated and he vows to himself that he will never again put himself in the way of such annoyance consequently he cuts good society 
not realizing that he would very soon overcome these initial difficulties and feel at home in it he must find amusement somewhere it is only natural to youth to crave it at first his taste is jarred by those inferior to him and his fastidiousness offended by their manners but such is the fatal adaptability of human nature to what is bad for it he soon becomes accustomed to all that he at first objected to and even forgets that he had ever found anything disagreeable in it after a few months his speech begins to assimilate the errors of those about him in his leisure hours he uses the very expressions that jarred upon him at first his dress and carriage deteriorate and he is well on his way downhill in life long before he realizes that he has quitted his own level probably for ever and if only he had held his own at a few gatherings and acquired experience even at the cost of a little present pain and mortification he would in the same interval of time be enjoying society educating himself in its customs and acquiring that exterior polish which comes of intimate acquaintance with its rules and ease in practising them should this little manual of manners be of use to any such in enabling them to master the theory as it were of social customs in the educated classes it will have attained its aim i have always felt the greatest compassion for young men when first introduced after school and college life to the routine of dinner dance and ball i have not forgotten the days when shyness made my own heart sink at the prospect of a dinner party and when the hardest task on earth was the finding of nothings to say to a partner at a ball it is a miserable feeling of confusion and gaucherie and if i can in any way avert it from others it will be a source of great gratification to me end of chapter one recording by phone chapter two of manners for men this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey Chapter 2 In the Street The rule of the road is a simple one, though it is often forgotten or neglected. Keep to the right. Easy enough for women, it is complicated in the case of men, by the necessity of always remaining on the curb side of any lady they may be accompanying. Should the lady keep to the right in meeting or in passing other persons, her escort may either keep by her or go out in the road. He will be able to judge for himself which cause will be advisable. His first duty is always to his companion. That need not make him wanting in courtesy to other women. If remaining by the side of his companion, should involve any inconvenience to the ladies of the other party, then he must give up his position and go out into the roadway to let the latter pass. Should these be men, no consideration is necessary. He keeps close by his lady's side. In crowded streets he may often have to fall behind, but he should never allow any one to interpose between her and him. Should the pressure from the crowd become extreme, his duty is to protect her from it as much as possible, but never by putting his arm round her waist. A hand on either side of the lady's shoulders is usually sufficient. In meeting acquaintances, a nod is sufficient for a male friend, unless his age or position is such as to render it advisable to raise the hat. Should a lady be with the acquaintance, any man meeting them must raise his hat. So must the individual walking with the lady. The etiquette of bowing is a simple one. Male acquaintances always wait for acknowledgement on the part of female, as well as from those men who are their superiors in age or position. But this does not mean that they are shyly to look away from them and to ignore them. On the contrary, they must show clearly by their manner that they are on the lookout for some sign of recognition and are ready to reply to it. 
Shyness often interferes with this and makes a young man look away, and this is occasionally misconstrued as an indifference and resented as such. The calm, quiet, collected expression of face that suits the occasion is not achieved at once. Sometimes the over-anxiety to make a good impression defeats itself, producing a blushing eagerness better suited to a girlish than a manly countenance. This, however, is a youthful fault that is not without its ingratiating side, though young men view it in themselves and in each other with unbounded scorn. This sentiment of self-contempt is a frequent one in, but in young people of both sexes. Their valuation of themselves varies as much as the barometer. It is as much affected by outward causes. After a snub, real or fancied, it goes down to zero. But as a rule it speedily recovers itself, and in most young men enjoys an agreeable thermometer of 85 degrees or so in the shade. The well-mannered man never puts out his hand in greeting until a lady extends hers. This is a test of good breeding that is constantly applied. To those uninitiated in the ways of society, it would naturally appear the right thing to give as cordial a greeting as possible. Therefore the hand is held out, even on introduction to a perfect stranger. This is wrong. The first move in the direction of cordiality must come from the lady the whole code of behaviour being based on the assumption that she is the social superior. The same holds good with elders and men of higher rank. When a man is introduced to these, he raises his hat and bows, though slightly. It is only to kings and princes that a low bow is made, or to those whose character and eminent position render an introduction to them a very high honour. In introducing two men to each other, the name of the inferior is mentioned first. By the inferior, I mean the younger, the less important, or of lower rank. Suppose one of the two to be a familiar friend, and another a comparatively new acquaintance. Then formality requires that the familiar friend shall be introduced to the other, being named first. The reason for this is that one naturally stands more on ceremony with the man one knows least. There may be counteracting circumstances, however, which would tend to reverse this order of things, but as a general rule, the social rank of both being equal, the above holds good. Never introduce a lady to a gentleman, but always the gentleman to the lady. That is, mention the man's name first, addressing yourself to the woman. Thus, allow me to introduce my friend Mr. Smith, Miss Jones, and follow this up immediately by saying, Miss Jones addressing Mr. Smith as you do so. It is a grave solecism to begin by introducing the lady. Trials very naturally conclude that the lady's name should be first mentioned, but on thinking it over they will soon perceive that to do so would infer that she is the lesser consideration of the two. It must always be borne in mind that the assumption of women's social superiority lies at the root of these rules of conduct. It is bad manners to introduce people without permission. Nor must this permission be asked in the hearing of the second party. If Mr. A wishes to know Miss B, the lady's leave must be obtained before he can be presented to her. The only exception to this rule is at a dance or ball, where introductions need not be regarded as leading to acquaintanceship. They are only for the dance and may be ignored next day. Here again it is the lady's privilege to ignore her partner, if she choose. But if she should bow to him, he must raise his hat, whether he desires to follow up the acquaintanceship or not. Objections more frequently arise on the woman's side. But should a man prefer to drop the matter, he can manage to convey in his manner a disinclination to do so, and yet behave with perfect politeness. A man I knew was once introduced at a ball to a girl, with whom he had danced two or three times, before he met her again, he heard that she had been actively concerned in circulating a slander about another girl, whom circumstances had misrepresented. I happened to see the next meeting between the two. The girl bowed, smiled, and showed some sign of the intention to stop and talk. The man raised his hat, looked extremely solemn and unsociable, and passed on. It was enough. The girl understood that he did not wish to resume the ballroom acquaintanceship, and very probably guessed why. He did it beautifully. 
Before leaving the subject of the promenade, I must clearly explain that the hat must be raised even in saluting a very familiar friend. If A, that friend is accompanied by a lady, and B, when one is oneself accompanied by a lady, even if she be only a mother or sister, it is one of the signs of caste that a man is equally polite to his relatives as he is to the relatives of others. We all know what to think of a man who omits small social duties where his wife is concerned, even when he proves by paying them duly to other women that he is aware of what he ought to do, he is at once set down as ill-bred, a cad, in fact. I once saw a Lord Mayor of London enter his carriage before his wife, who scrambled in after him as though well accustomed to do so. One does not expect the refinement of good manners and civil dignitaries as a rule, but this little action told the spectators more about the man than they would ever have found out in the newspapers. They at once perceived that he was unversed in the ways of good society. But some may suggest that this may have been on some state occasion, when his mayoral dignity obliged him to precede his wife. No, it was after a wedding. And besides, can any one fancy the Prince of Wales in any circumstances entering his carriage without having previously handed in the princess should she be his companion? If accompanied by a dog, or dogs, their owner must hold himself responsible for their good behaviour. If his pets trespass in any way, he must apologise for them and do his best to repair any damage they have done. Should one of his dogs jump on a lady and make her gown muddy, he must offer his services and endeavour to get rid of the traces of the accident. If the lady wishes, should she show a disinclination to accept his aid, he must at once withdraw, raising his hat as he does so. Should his dog attack another dog, he must immediately call him off, administer correction, and apologise to the owner of the dog assaulted. I saw a young man once, in these circumstances, beat the other dog after his own had jumped on it and bitten its ear. He was dressed like a gentleman, but his behaviour gave a truer indication of him than did his garments. Whistling and singing are incompatible with the conduct of a gentleman in the street, though this by no means applies to a quiet country road where ceremonious bearing is not required. Nor is it permitted to wear the hands in the pockets and walking in the park, or the streets of a town or city. This is probably one of the reasons that the cane or stick is still carried, though the original cause, that of self-defence, in an age that was destitute of law and order, fortunately exists no longer. There are men who would not know what to do with their hands if they had not a cane or umbrella. This is partly the fault of those who have charge of boys when they are growing, and to allow them to lounge about in slovenly attitudes with their hands for ever in their pockets. Then, when they begin to enter society, they are quite at a loss. At schools, where boys are regularly drilled, the whole effect of the drilling is done away with by the way in which the boys are allowed to sit and stand in the most remarkable attitudes of slouchy awkwardness. It is only when they are at drill or out walking with the masters that any notice is taken of their carriage yet it is an important point with regard to health that the soldier's shoulders should be held well back, the chest forward and the head up. Should a man be so fortunate as to be of some service to any lady in the street, such as picking up a parcel or sunshade she may have dropped, or helping her out of any small difficulty, he must raise his hat and withdraw at once. Such trifling acts as these do not by any means constitute an acquaintanceship, and to remain by her side when the incident is over would look like presuming on what he had done, as though it gave him a right to her continued acknowledgement. This would be ungentlemanly. At the same time, these occurrences are sometimes deliberately planned by girls and women with a direct view to scraping attainments with young men. It is scarcely necessary to say the girls who soup to this kind of manoeuvring are hardly ever gentlewomen. Members of good families have been known to do such things in the wild exuberance of youth and high spirits, but they cannot hope to retain the respect of those who know them when they deliberately lower themselves in such ways as these. Picking up promiscuous male acquaintances as a practice fraught with danger, it cannot be denied that girls of the lower middle classes are often prone to it, 
and there are thousands of young men who have no feminine belongings in the great towns and cities where they live, and who are found responsive to this indiscriminating mode of making acquaintances. But they must often hesitate before choosing as wife a girl who shows so little discretion as to walk and talk with young men of whom she knows nothing beyond what they choose to tell her. The seaside season is prolific in these chance acquaintanceships, flirtations as they may perhaps be called. Bicycling is well known to favour them, but as they are far removed from the practice of the class of society to which belong these gentlemen of whom this little book treats, they may be dismissed with a few words of advice. Should any young man become acquainted with a girl in this manner, let him show his innate chivalry by treating her in every way as he would wish his own sister to be treated in similar circumstances. If he becomes attached to her, let him first find out all about her that he possibly can, and should what he hears be encouraging, then let him ask her to introduce him to her family as a suitor for her hand. Should the girl fall in love with him, let him protect her against herself like a pure chevalier, like an honourable and high-minded English gentleman. If he feels that he cannot reciprocate her sentiment, he should give up seeing her. Should she, as some girls of the kind have been known to do, pursue him with letters making appointments, she makes his task of remuneration a difficult one, but he should fulfil it nevertheless. It is difficult in this way. Suppose a girl writes to a young man, meet me at the tea rooms, number 440 Bond Street, tomorrow afternoon. There is no chance of replying in time to prevent her going there, and to absent himself would be to administer a severe snub to a girl whom he likes very well, and who has flattered his self-love in many ways during their acquaintanceship. What can he do? It is a point he must decide for himself, taking all the circumstances into consideration, and not forgetting to regard her ultimate welfare in the matter, at least as much as his own actual wishes. This may seem to some young men a very high faulting view to take of such a small matter in meeting a young woman and having tea together. Most of them, finding that a girl was growing fond of them, would encourage the feeling by every means in their power, regardless of whether it could ever end in marriage, and careless of everything beyond the gratification of their own vanity. But there are bright exceptions to those who do not allow themselves to be carried away by the flattery implied in a girl's attentions, and who can consider her welfare in selfless fashion. Sometimes fastidious taste comes to their aid, and makes withdrawal from an interesting companionship comparatively easy, for after all the manly young man has a prejudice in favour of doing his own wooing. It is not at all necessary that a man should accept invitations from a girl to meet her at restaurants, subscription dances, bazaars or any other place. If a girl so far forgets herself and is so lacking in modesty and propriety as to make appointments with young men in such ways as these, she cannot be worth much and may lead the young man into a very serious scrape. A public horse whipping is an extremely disagreeable thing and yet cases have been known were such have been administered by irate brothers or fathers, when the only fault committed by the young man had been to obey the commands of a forward and bold young woman, one of the sort to whom Hamlet would have said, Get thee to a nunnery. Such invitations are better ignored, though it is difficult for the average young man to resist the temptation of being courted and flattered, and of seeking the society of girls to administer these pleasant attentions. But if their standard is a high one, they would say to themselves, What should I like another fellow to do, supposing the girl was my sister? Almost always he mentally adds, God forbid. This clears up the question for him at once. If he is high-minded and honourable, he keeps away. If he is unscrupulous and self-indulgent, he meets the girl and lets the acquaintanceship drift onto dangerous ground. Such girls as these can never tell if a man whose past and present and surrounding circumstances are unknown to her is a scoundrel or otherwise. Fortunately, the code of manners obtaining amongst the educated and well brought up forbids all such indiscriminate acquaintance making. Girls who stoop to it are usually those who have failed to secure attention in their own circle and belong, as a rule, to the sort of girl who marries a groom 
or runs away with a good-looking footman. A young man once asked me if it would be etiquette to offer an unknown lady an umbrella in the street. Supposing she stood in need of one, I replied, no lady would accept the offer from a stranger, and the other sort of person might never return the umbrella. In large towns, women of breeding soon learn to view casual attentions from well-dressed men with the deepest distrust. They would suffer any amount of inconvenience rather than accept a favour from a stranger, knowing that so many men make it their amusement to prowl about the streets, looking after pretty faces and graceful figures, and forcing their attentions on the owners. Contemptible curs they are, whether young or old, and they are of all ages. Very young girls are sometimes extremely unpleasant experiences with such men, not only in the streets, but in omnibuses, trams and trains. Cultivating a gentlemanly exterior, they can yet never be gentlemen, and a good, pure woman finds something hateful in the look of their eyes, the whole expression of their faces. It cannot be denied, however, that there is a corresponding class of women and girls who make promiscuous male acquaintances in the streets, and a young man learns to distinguish these from respectable members of the community almost as soon as a young girl learns to dread and fear the prowling man. The existence of such a state of things makes self-respecting women most careful to accept no advances from a stranger, and the true gentleman, understanding this, refrains from offers of assistance that he would gladly make were society so constituted as to be free from such pests as the above. In passing ladies on the promenade in the street or park, if the man chanced to be smoking, he always takes his cigar from his mouth, replacing it when the lady or ladies have passed on. In the crowded streets of great cities, this, if carried out in full entirety, would be too much. Therefore it is observed only with reference to such ladies as pass the smoker quite closely. I know he is a gentleman, said a girl once of a good-looking young fellow whose appearance had pleased her. I know he is a gentleman, for he stopped smoking directly he saw us. It is in the observance of little things of this kind that one shows clearly one's breeding or lack of it. When a young man is walking with a lady and happens to meet another lady with whom he is on more intimate terms than with his companion, he must ask pardon of the latter if he should stop to speak. Excuse me for one moment, he would say, and his companion, if a gentlewoman, would walk some yards on, and then slowly stroll along until he joined her again. The strict rule is that when walking of a lady, a man should never leave her side. Suppose a young man were to meet his mother or sister while he was in the company of a lady unknown to them, he must not introduce her to them or them to her without having previously obtained special permission on both sides. There are young men who make acquaintance with girls in a lower walk of life than their own. It would be an insult to mother or sister to introduce a milliner's apprentice or an assistant in a shop, or in fact any one whom he had picked up without a regular introduction. No respectable young woman would walk with or talk with any man to whom she had not had a proper introduction. The inference is that those who do so are not respectable and must not therefore be introduced to those who are. The old rule was that when a gentleman stopped to speak to a lady in the street, he walked a little way with her in the direction in which she had been going. But now this is less observed than it used to be. The lady herself, if she wishes the conversation to be a short one, stops at once, knowing that it would be easier for a man to terminate in these circumstances than if he were sauntering by her side. End of chapter 2. Recording by Ruth. Chapter 3 of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Broda. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 3. In a Carriage. In handing ladies to their carriage, a man offers his right arm to the senior of the party and walks with her to the door, opening it with his left hand. The others will probably follow without escort, but if not, 
he must offer it to each in turn, holding an umbrella over them should it be raining. He closes the door and conveys their orders to the footman or coachman. Should he be invited to enter the carriage with them, he always takes the back seat, that is, with his back to the horses, unless specially invited to the front one. He must not either raise or lower the windows unless requested to do so. Should he be smoking, he throws away his cigar or cigarette at once. If he should be a very intimate acquaintance of the lady, he may ask her permission to smoke, but never otherwise, since it is disagreeable for a woman to refuse such permission, and consequently she often gives it when she really dislikes the smell of tobacco, especially in the limited space of a carriage, should it be a closed one. It may be as well to mention here that the proper pronunciation of the word broom is as though it were spelled B-R-O-O-M, quite short and monosyllabic. This is a trifle, of course, but, like many other equally small matter, it is indicative of those accustomed to good society. End of chapter 3 Recording by Jen Broda Chapter 5 of Manners for Men This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Summers Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey Chapter 5 Smoking The etiquette in this, as in many other matters, has quite altered during the last few years. At one time it was considered a sign of infamously bad taste to smoke in the presence of women in any circumstances, but it is now no longer so. So many women smoke themselves that in some houses even the drawing-room is thrown open to Princess Nicotine. The example of the Prince of Wales has been largely instrumental in sweeping away the old restrictions. He smokes almost incessantly. On one occasion, at the Ranelagh Club, I noticed that he consumed four cigars in rapid succession, almost without five minutes' interval between them. The only time that he left off smoking, during the three hours that he remained in the pavilion with the princess and other ladies, was for ten minutes, when tea was handed round. It is now no uncommon thing to see a man in evening dress smoking in a brougham with a lady on their way to opera, theatre, or dinner engagement. This is going rather far, for a woman's evening dress implies shut windows, except in the height of summer, and her garments become as much impregnated with the odor of tobacco as if she herself had been smoking. Some men have a knack of ridding their clothes and themselves of the fumes of smoke in a wonderful way. Perhaps one reason of this is that the tobacco they use is of a mild sort. Perhaps the diligent use of the clothes brush is another. But there are also men round whom cling the odors of stale tobacco with a very disagreeable constancy. Why it should be so, I cannot pretend to say. It must be due to carelessness of some kind, and carelessness in such matters amounts to bad manners. Even to men who smoke, and much more to those who do not, the smell of stale tobacco is revolting. Fancy, then, how it must offend the olfactory nerves of women. Such men suggest the stable-yard while they are yet several yards away. A very delicate, even exquisite, personal cleanliness is characteristic of the true gentleman, and more particularly the English gentleman, who is noted all the world over for his devotion to his tub, and his immaculate propriety in all matters of the toilette. This is not claiming too much for my countrymen. It is acknowledged by other nations that ours is superior in this respect. Once, indeed, I heard a curious inversion of this. At a foreign hotel, one waiter said to the other, in their mutual language, What dirty fellows these English must be to want such a lot of washing! I've carried up four cans of water to number 47 this morning. Sauntering up the street of a small German town one day, two English ladies saw, a couple of yards away, a party of men standing admiring an ancient gateway. "'They must be English,' said one of the ladies, 
and before she could finish her sentence, the other finished it for her, in the very words she had been about to utter. They are so beautifully clean. This characteristic is carried to an extreme in the close clipping of the hair, but as fashion ordains that it must be worn very short, its behests must be obeyed by all who wish to be in society and of it. Who is that long-haired fellow? is the question invariably asked about any man whose visits to the barber are infrequent. Must be an artist or a music man, is the frequent commentary. Sometimes he is merely careless of the conventionalities, and by being so proves that he is rather out of it, where good society is concerned. The rule appears to be that directly a man finds that he has any hair worth brushing, he must immediately go and have it cut. It would be much more becoming if allowed to grow a little longer, but things being as they are, only the few can afford to defy the ordinary custom. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of Manners for Men – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Summers. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 6. In or On an Omnibus. The humble omnibus may be thought by some readers too democratic a place of conveyance to be considered in a book on manners. Not at all. There are several reasons why it should have a place in such a volume. The first is that during the last ten years or so, the omnibus has been largely used by women of the educated, cultured, and well-dressed classes. Another, and stronger reason, is that no considerations of the kind should affect a man's manners. If he can behave like a gentleman in a carriage, he is almost certainly to do so in an omnibus, and vice versa. It is even more difficult in the humbler vehicle. In a carriage, one is seldom crowded up to the degree that often happens in the plebeian bus. In fact, there are far more opportunities for the display of good manners in the latter than in the former. Many of them are of a negative character. True courtesy, for instance, will prevent a man from infringing the rights of his neighbors on either side by occupying more than his allotted space. Very stout men are obliged to do so, but at least they need not spread out their knees in a way that is calculated to aggravate the evil. Nor need they arrange themselves in a comfortable oblique position, with the result of enhancing the inconvenience they must necessarily cause to those near them. Even a thin man can take up a quantity of room by thus disposing himself at an angle of forty-five with the other occupants of an omnibus. The morning paper may be converted into an offensive weapon in the hands of the rude and careless, who open it out to its fullest width, regardless of the comfort of those sitting next to them. Newspapers are rather unwieldy things to turn and twist about in a limited space, but this very circumstance affords a man an opportunity of displaying his skill in manipulating the large wide sheets without dashing them in the face of his nearest neighbor, or knocking up against anybody in a series of awkward movements that a little care could easily convert into leisurely, graceful ones. There is another way in which men are apt to be careless, and that is in the disposal of a wet umbrella. Women are even more so, but these remarks are intended particularly for men, and beyond acknowledging that members of my own sex are equal sinners, I must leave them out of the question. When anyone takes a dripping umbrella into an omnibus, he must charge himself with the task of seeing that it annoys no one but himself. If he can, at the same time, protect himself, well and good but he must be altruistic in the matter and care for others first, the alternative being to prove himself lacking in one form of good manners. He must not even let his wet umbrella 
lean up against a vacant part of the cushioned seat, rendering it damp for the next comer. His social conscience cannot be up to its work if he permits himself to ignore the right of the absent to consideration, merely because they are absent. Allowing umbrellas and sticks to protrude so as to trip up unwary passengers is another thing to be avoided. Carrying a stick or umbrella under the arm with the ferrule protruding at the back and threatening the eyes of those who walk behind is always a reprehensible practice, and one that is fraught with danger, and it is perhaps more than ever dangerous when the proprietor is ascending or descending the steps of an omnibus. At such moments, passengers are liable to sudden checks from various causes, and the resultant backward jerk can be quite annoying enough to those behind without the aggravation of a pointed stick assaulting them. I have seen a girl's hat torn off her head in this way, its numerous securing pins making havoc in her coiffure, and eliciting lively expressions of pain. It might appear hardly necessary to advocate care in walking up past other passengers inside an omnibus, for fear of treading on their feet, and to recommend a word of apology in case of any transgression but there have been cases which point to the desirability of a word of advice on such points. The ready apology covers a multitude of social sins. From some men it comes with an expression of such earnest solicitude that, anxious to reassure them, one quite willingly makes light of the damage done. In escorting a lady, a man hands her into the omnibus before entering it himself, and if she prefers the top, he lets her mount the staircase in front of him. There seems to be an idea in the lowly classes that it is correct to precede a lady in ascending steps or stairs. This is not in accordance with the practice of good society. If circumstances do not admit of the two walking abreast, then the lady goes first, both in ascending and descending any stairs. It is by no means necessary that any man should resign his seat in or on an omnibus simply because a woman wishes for it. The conductor has no right to ask if any gentleman will go outside to oblige a lady, and no gentlewoman would allow him to ask such a favor on her behalf. The inside passengers have selected inside seats, thereby testifying to their preference for them and they should be allowed to retain them without interference. I have seen a delicate-looking boy, racked with a hacking cough, induced to ride outside on a cold and rainy night, in order that a fat, rosy, healthy woman might have his inside seat. I felt all the more indignant on his behalf, because the woman never even thanked him. It was no business of mine, but I was rejoiced to hear a man's voice mutter in the darkness. She looks better able to face it than that pale-faced lad. But the woman wore a smug, well-pleased air, little knowing that her fellow passengers were almost all regarding her with a feeling of dislike. I repeat that no lady, in the highest sense of the term, would ever permit the conductor of an omnibus to ask such a favor for her she would not ask it for herself, unlike a woman whom I saw one day mount on the step of an omnibus and inquire of the insides, "'Won't any gentleman ride outside to oblige a lady?' the lady being herself. It can never be out of place for a man to give up his seat in favor of the old and infirm, or for a woman with a baby in her arms.' but such matters as these belong to a region of heart and mind beyond mere manners, and it is useless to suggest any line of action on such subjects. The impulse must come from within. There have been women so unreasonable as to complain of men smoking on the top of an omnibus. Could anything be more illogical? First, they invade the seats that have been claimed by man as his right, or perhaps unjustly, for many long years, and then they feel annoyed because he smokes in their presence. Or 
to speak accurately. They are petulant because his tobacco is often rank, strong, and consequently evil-smelling. But no man need feel it necessary to put out his pipe or throw away his cigar in these circumstances. Should he find himself so placed that the wind blows his smoke in the face of a woman, he may propose to change seats with her, in order that she may be spared the inconvenience. But no woman could rationally expect him to do more. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Summers. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter Seven On Horseback. A great change has taken place during the last few years in the character of riding costume for the park. The subject may scarcely be a suitable one for a little book intended for those unaccustomed to the usages of the society of the wealthy, but there are almost always exceptional cases in which such information may be found of use. Only quite old-fashioned people ride in black coats, the usual gear consisting of knickerbocker suits with Norfolk or other country jacket, brown tops, and bowler hats. It must be admitted that this is a distinct gain in picturesqueness. Straw hats are often seen on riders in the park, but these have not quite so good an effect. The old formalities in dress are rapidly disappearing. A man may ride in town in a tweed suit, which once would have been considered highly heterodox. He may even walk about London in the height of the season in a tweed suit but it is not considered correct for him to join his friends in the park without reverting to the black coat and high hat many an old statesman is still to be seen in the park riding in frock coat and tall hat just as john leech depicted the men of his day there are certain rules of etiquette connected with riding on horseback which no one can afford to ignore it is extremely ill-mannered to gallop noisily past a mounted lady, the risk being of startling her horse and inconveniencing her, if not subjecting her to an accident. The rule of the road for equestrians is to keep to the left, exactly the opposite to that for pedestrians. In passing others in front, a detour is made to the right. In meeting other riders or wheel traffic of any sort, the rider keeps close to the left. In accompanying a lady, the gentleman keeps on her right hand, whether in town or on country roads. At a meet of hounds, where ladies in carriages often assemble, it is not polite to keep too near them if mounted on a fidgety horse. When the hounds throw off, the inexperienced in such matters has a disagreeable way of getting in front in his eagerness, and sometimes overriding the hounds. This, in the eyes of the huntsman, is not a fault, it is a crime of the blackest dye. If commissioned to take charge of a lady in the hunting field, a man must sacrifice his sporting instincts to a certain extent in order to see her safe over her fences, giving her a lead or following her lead as circumstances may dictate. His desire to be in at the death may be as great as hers, but he must not indulge it at the expense of his politeness. Very often his charge may beg of him to go on and leave her to her own devices. If he should perceive that she is really uncomfortable about keeping him back, he may possibly yield to her persuasion. But in the case of any accident happening to her, he would be certainly called to account by those who had placed her in his charge. One of the mistakes made by novices in the hunting field is that of getting themselves up in pink, though they may not be a member of any hunt. This is more particularly the case when the packs are near town. Good West End tailors would never allow their clients to make such mistakes as these. 
they are the best authorities on all the minutia of country riding costume, and it is well for the customer to put himself unreservedly in the hands of the long-experienced in such matters. Of course, this means high charges. Experience and skill are commercial commodities, just as much as fine cloth and silk linings. But if a man can afford to go a-hunting, he ought to be able to afford the advice of a good tailor. In mounting a lady on horseback, the gentleman takes her left foot in his right hand, and when she springs he helps her in this manner to reach the saddle, and afterwards adjusting her left foot in the stirrup, and arranging her habit for her. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Summers. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 8 Driving. The same rule of the road applies to driving as to riding. In the crowded traffic of large towns and cities, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to observe the good old rule of courtesy that prohibits the driver of any private carriage from overtaking and passing that of a friend or neighbor on the road. The members of the four-in-hand and coaching clubs still observe it, and seldom pass each other without an apologetic wave of the hand or raising of the hat. A gentleman driving a mail phaeton in the park with a lady by his side must, of course, acknowledge all salutes by raising his hat, if he is sufficiently expert to admit of his doing so without risk. It is not every one who can emulate the Prince of Wales who, when driving a coach, can take a cigar from his lips and raise his hat with the whip hand, the reins, of course, being in the left. It is not unusual, nowadays, to see a man driven by a lady. In such a case he must be on the alert to afford her every assistance in his power. In handing a lady up to her place on a coach, some expertness is required, especially where the usual short ladder is not available, and she has to mount first on the wheel and then on to the coach itself. The box seat of a coach to the left of the driver is considered the place of honor, and the lady invited to occupy it is very appreciative, as a rule, of this mark of attention. It is scarcely necessary to remark that a man must be as careful about the invitations for a drive on his foreign hand as he would be in other circumstances. A lady would resent being asked to meet anyone unsuitable in a drive, even though the latter may be relegated to a back seat. Some ladies are very anxious to take the reins and drive themselves, a circumstance which has often occasioned agonies of nervousness to other women on the coach. It is quite possible to refuse such a request in a polite and gentlemanly way, partly by seeming to ignore it or laughing it off. It is not a bad plan, when some such request is supposed to be imminent, to bind oneself beforehand by a promise to one of the timid ladies. This promise can be produced with great effect when occasion arises. A man usually dismounts when calling for a lady to take her for a ride, if she is to be mounted. Sometimes, however, this rule is remitted, as in the case of a restive and very fresh animal. The groom then assists the lady to mount. The driver of a foreign hand very seldom dismounts in such circumstances, though, of course, there are exceptions to this as to almost all other rules. It used to be considered bad manners to smoke when driving with a lady. This is now quite antediluvian, so to speak. Permission must, of course, always be asked of the lady. It is scarcely ever refused, and it is almost an exceptional thing to see a man driving without a cigar between his teeth. 
should the lady driven meet some acquaintances unknown to her charioteer, and wish to stop and converse with them, he raises his hat and awaits her pleasure. She will probably introduce him, but if not, he takes no part in the conversation. The only thing he can do is to remain passive, but unless the lady feels justified in introducing him, it is an error of taste on her part to enter into conversation with her friends. Some ladies have a great disinclination to mount a foreign hand or mail phaeton until the driver is seated with the reins in his hand and in full command of the horses. There is nothing surprising in this, for, after all, the groom who stands at the head of the horses before the start has very little control over them, and one or two disagreeable accidents have occurred in this way, the horses taking fright and escaping from his grasp. Consequently, it would be no breach of good manners for the gentleman driving to take his seat and thus reassure his nervous companion. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Manners for Men」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jervis International. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter Nine Games and Recreations. Chess and Wisp Permanently Popular. A man who can play a good game of chess or even an excellent rubber of whist must be aware that the acquirement involves an education in itself. Neither is ever likely to become unpopular among the best classes of society. Chess and whist clubs increase in number as time goes on. But for the purposes of everyday life, less exigent games are found more useful. One should be able to play the minor games. Billiards, backgammon, poker, bezique, baccarat, écarté, draughts, vegetun, and loo may be mentioned among the minor accomplishments with which the modern young man finds it convenient to be equipped. That a bad use has been made of some of these by converting them into media for gambling is not to be denied. At the same time, there is no reason why those who play them in moderation should refrain from doing so because others abuse rather than use these means of recreation. These things are innocent in themselves. A round game affords a very innocent mode of spending an enjoyable evening, and country house life especially is enlivened in this way, and often quite necessary. Home life, whether in town or country, is apt to be monotonous particularly for the young members of the family. If there is not occasionally an amusing game got up to pass away the evening hours, and anything that adds to the attractions of home must at least have one excellent recommendation. A man's breeding is shown in his play. Apart from utter considerations, the demeanor of a young man when playing cards affords a very good test of his manners. Some of them appear to think that the only fun to be had out of the game lies in cheating. Very open and transparent cheating, to be sure, but still sufficient to spoil the amusement of others. A curious development of money greed is sometimes observable in players who will show extreme exasperation at the loss of so simple a coin as a penny. Irability over games. There are many fairly good-tempered men and women who evince extreme irritability over games of any kind. To play with such as these is very disagreeable, and the tendency to irascibility should be firmly checked by those who wish to be popular in society. The host or hostess always takes the lead in these games, or else deputies someone else to do so. It is a sign of ill breeding when an outsider assumes the command of a game without having been asked to do so. An outsider may not take the lead unsolicited. Unfortunately, gambling games are very popular at some houses, and it is possible for a young man, 
being unaware of the fact to be drawn in and lose more than he can afford before he can politely extricate himself. Men and houses to be avoided. In such circumstances, the only thing that he can do is religiously to avoid any such house in future. It is a manner of notoriety that there are men who make good incomes by fleecing the young and experienced whom they invite to their homes under the guise of friendship. But even when there is no deliberate dishonesty in question, as in these cases, the host or hostess, out of pure love of gambling, draws in the guests to play for high sums, things to be reckoned with. Unpartable is it, true, but such things have to be reckoned with and avoided if possible. The manor is not confined to London. Country house life has much to answer for under the same heading. End of chapter 9. Recorded by Jervis International. Chapter 10 of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jervis International. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 10. The Rule of the Road on the River. The Rule of the Road on the River. There is a rule of the road for the river, and those who boat on the Thames on crowded days fervently wish that it were better understood. There does not appear to be any means of acquiring the necessary information. If such means exist, they have never come under my notice, and for at least one summer I spent many hours daily in that agreeable form of exercise. With the tide, the middle of the stream. Boats coming down with the tide keep the middle of the river. Those going against it hug the shore on either side. But in passing other boats coming in the same direction, they must go out in a semicircle, leaving the front boat the shore. Tugboats are always given this advantage. Upstream, either side. In meeting other boats coming downstream, which really have no right to the shore, but are mistakenly kept near the margin by inexperienced steerers, the boat going upstream should not go out, but keep toward the land. The Rights of Anglers The rights of the numerous anglers should be respected, and it is not only courteous but politic to do so, as it is disagreeable to have the lines entangled in the boat. Sailing boats. Rowboats give way to sailing boats on the river, especially when the latter are tackling to use the breeze. As to steam launches, their motto too often appears to be, might is right. Occupants of small boats keep a sharp lookout for these. Passing through locks. In passing through the locks, the usual politeness of refraining from shooting ahead of boats in front should be observed. Any activity, emulation of this kind, is a very risky business in the same way when pulling a boat over the rollers. A man is bound to yield the pass to ladies or any boat containing ladies. In fact, the courtesies of the river may be summed up as similar to those on land. End of chapter 10. Recording by Jervis International. Chapter 11 of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Broda. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 11. Dinner Parties. Mrs. X requests the pleasure of Mr. L's company at dinner on Thursday, the 16th of February, at 8 o'clock. Mr. L. accepts with pleasure Mrs. X's kind invitation to dinner on Thursday, the 16th of February. These are the preliminaries, the lady's address being on the sheet of paper or card on which her invitation has been written. Three weeks' notice is usual, but sometimes in the season, 
when many parties are going on, invitations are sent out four, five, or six weeks beforehand in order to secure the guests. In the case of lions, even longer invitations have been given, but as one of the first principles of good breeding is to never corner anybody, it is scarcely fair to invite those who are in much request without giving them the option of refusal. An invitation of seven or eight weeks' length scarcely allows one to plead a pre-engagement and often defeats the eager hostess's own end by inducing the lion to accept without any intention of being present, writing later on to renege, to use a good old whist term, but as our young man is scarcely yet a lion, and probably not overburdened with engagements for dinner or any other social function, we may imagine him accepting with a free mind. Should anything intervene to prevent him carrying out his engagement, he is in duty bound to let his hostess know as early as possible that he cannot be present at her dinner party. This is more especially and particularly necessary with dinners, though it holds good with regard to all invitations. But with dinner, there is a peculiar obligation laid upon the guests. The choice and arrangement of them involves care on the part of the dinner-giver, more so than in the case of any other meal. In fact, dinner stands alone as an institution, sacred to the highest rites of hospitality. To be invited is an honor to the young man, who is just beginning his social life. To absent himself would be a gross rudeness, unless he could plead circumstances of a pressing nature. It is considered a great infraction of good manners to wire on the very day of the party that one cannot dine as arranged unless something has occurred to justify such conduct. The hostess can with difficulty find a substitute at short notice, and the whole plan of her table is destroyed by the absence of one person. There are few people who would not feel offended at being invited to fill a gap of the kind, and this is what makes it so extremely discourteous to disappoint at the last moment, as it were. The unfortunate hostess thinks, is there any one good-natured enough to come and fill the vacant place? Sometimes this is the raison d'etre of a young man's first invitation. Let him accept it by all means, even though he is perfectly aware that he was not his entertainer's first choice. Many a young man feels nervous about his first dinner party. There are few puzzling things that trouble him in prospect. He wonders if he should wear gloves, as ladies do, taking them off at the dinner table. Let me set his mind at rest on this small point at once. He need not wear gloves. In fact, he must not. Another little matter to be remembered is that a quarter of an hour's grace is always understood in dinner invitations. Should the hour indicated be eight o'clock, then care must be taken to time the arrival at five or ten minutes past the hour. But it is better to be too early than too late. A want of punctuality at this meal is unpardonable. It is the very height of rudeness, annoying to the host and hostess, displeasing to the guests, and regarded as outrageous by the cook. When our young man is shown into the drawing room, he at once goes up to his hostess, no matter whether there is anyone he knows nearer to the door than the lady of the house. This is always a fixed rule, whether it be on the occasion of a call or visit, or on having been invited to a party of any kind. When he has been greeted by his hostess, he looks round the room to see if there is anyone present whom he knows. If so, he goes up to the ladies first, if there are any of his acquaintance present, and afterwards greets the gentlemen. His host will probably have shaken hands with him immediately after his wife has done so. He will then be told what lady he is to take down to dinner, and to be introduced to her if he does not already know her. He must bow, not shake hands, and make small talk for her during the interval between his introduction and the announcement of dinner. Here is his first real difficulty. To converse with a perfect stranger is always one of the initial social accomplishments to be learned, and it is not at all an easy thing at first. It needs practice. 
Ninety men out of every hundred offer a remark upon the weather. But unless there has been something very extraordinary going on in the meteorological line, it is better to avoid this subject if possible. A girl at Ascot said to me one lovely day, That's the eighth man who has informed me that it's a beautiful day. Up came a ninth with the very same observation, and both she and I felt inclined to titter like very schoolgirls. It is far better to start with something more original. It is as well to keep the pronoun I in the background just at first. If your partner is as nice as she might be, she will soon give you abundant opportunity for talking about yourself. By the way, a man must not at his very first dinner party expect to be given a pretty girl to take down. He may possibly be so fortunate, but those prizes are usually reserved for men of more experience in social life. The young man has probably been invited to make up the necessary number of men, and an unmarried lady of uncertain age, or an elderly woman without much claim to consideration, will probably fall to his share. However, there is consolation. She will be excellent for practicing upon. He would not mind making small mistakes so much as if his partner were a young and charming girl. Nor is the art of making small talk so difficult as it would be with a pair of bright and youthful eyes, beaming into your own, and confusing you into forgetfulness of all but their own delightful language. But what to talk about is the puzzle of the moment. I have known a good beginning made with some such remark as, Do you know everybody here? This leads, perhaps, to the acquisition of some information as to the other guests. At table, there will be more to suggest topics. The floral decorations often lead up to conversation. The colors of the flowers remind one of pictures, and the lady on one's right may be asked if she has been to any exhibitions that may be open. If so, what pictures she liked best? Does she paint? Has she read the novel of the hour? What she thinks of it? Does she bike? At this rate, our novice gets on swimmingly and may safely be left to himself. I must not omit some small details dealing with the guest on his arrival and on his way afterwards from the drawing to the dining room. The servant who admits him takes his overcoat and hat, either in the hall or in a room set apart for the purpose. Should he be accompanied by a lady, he follows her upstairs, and she enters the room slightly in advance of him, probably about a yard or so. The young man must not have the appearance of hanging back, however. He walks steadily and rather briskly up the room. When the move to the dining room is made, the gentlemen offer to the ladies the arm which will place them on the wall side of the staircase, thus avoiding the contact of their dresses with the balusters. But should the dining room be as it very frequently is, on the same floor as the drawing-room, then the right arm is offered. The lady sits on the right of her escort at table. The servants usually indicate the seats that the guests are to occupy. Sometimes the host, previously instructed by the hostess, comes to the rescue with, Your seat is here, I believe, Mr. So-and-so who immediately takes his lady to the chair on the right of the two the couple are to occupy. The system of name cards is observed in some circles, but it is not a good one. It is distressing in these days of short sight and small rooms to see several couples wandering about endeavoring to decipher the names on the small cards. It is much better for the host to have made himself master of the order in which the guests are to be seated and as he enters the dining room, first with the lady of highest social importance, he is ready to point out their places to each couple as they enter. The first thing to be done on sitting down is to unfold the table napkin and place it across the knee. The menu is then consulted and a mental note made on any favorite dish, so that it may not be refused. But all the time a flow of small talk must be kept up with one's partner of the hour. Sometimes she turns to talk with the man on her right. Then her escort may converse with the lady on his left, if she is disengaged. 
but he must always remember that his first duty is to her whom he took down. There will probably be three or four wine glasses on our young friend's right. One of these, either a long-stemmed wide-cupped glass or a small tumbler, is for champagne. The colored glass is for hock, the slenderest and smallest is for sherry, and the claret glass occupies in dimensions a midway between those of the champagne and the claret glass. With regard to the knives and forks, everything is now made very easy for the novice by the way in which the table is laid. The tablespoon is for soup, which must be eaten from the side of the spoon close to the point. The fish knife and fork are placed outside the others, so as to be ready to the hand, the fish course coming directly after the soup. The dishes are usually all handed round at dinner parties, the carving being done at the sideboard or in an immediately adjoining room, but sometimes the host carves the joint and game. There is occasionally a subtle reason for this preference, not wholly unconnected with a taste for those morsels that especially appeal to the gourmand. The host may desire to secure these for some special appreciative guest or for himself. In some families, the principal dishes are always placed before the master of the house to be carved. Maid servants can rarely carve well, and butlers have gone considerably out of fashion in the upper middle classes of society of late years. When offered the usual choice of dishes or wines, the guest must decide at once and indicate his choice without delay. Any hesitation gives him the air of being unable to reject either, of being in the position with regard to food occupied by the poet who wrote, How happy could I be with either, where to other dear charmer away. So he must be prompt, and should the dish be handed round, help himself without delay. On this very point of helping himself, I have seen young men endure excruciating agonies of shyness. Sometimes they take the merest morsel of some excellent dish, though they would very well like to have some more. At other times they help themselves to far too much, because they are so confused that they will not take the necessary time to separate for their own share a moderate quantity. Occasionally they drop the spoon or fork with a clatter into the dish after which they look intensely miserable for ten minutes or so. The best way to avoid all this is to preserve absolute self-possession by reflecting that the other guests are all too well occupied to pay any attention to such trifling matters. The self-consciousness of which shyness is the outward and visible sign makes a young man feel that everyone is observing him, especially when he is awkward in handling things but he may console himself with the conviction that he is of much less importance to them than their own dinner, to say nothing of the ladies who sit beside them. When asked to choose between claret or hock, he may either mention one or indicate the glass. Sherry, sir, is the first wine handed round. Then comes the choice between claret and hock. Afterwards, champagne, sir, usually answered by slightly drawing the champagne glass forward, or by a nod, sometimes by a shake of the head. An occasional thanks to the servant is not amiss, but it is unnecessary to keep on expressing gratitude. Some people never dream of saying thank you, others say it out of pure graciousness of manner and gentleness of mind, so our young man may take his choice. I have observed that when a neat and pretty parlor-maid waits at the table, she is more likely to be thanked than a man-servant, and this is not only by gentlemen, but by ladies as well. I offer no explanation of why this should be so. I merely record the fact as I have noted it. The perfection of service resolves itself into absolute accuracy of machinery, united to the observant watchfulness of long training. One barely discovers that one needs bread when it is presented at one's elbow. In the same way, vegetables, wine, aerated waters, or whatever one may be drinking, arrives at exactly the right moment. The mechanism or organization of such waiting is so good that there is no interruption of conversation. The servants understand that a mere turning away from the dish means rejection. 
Should any guest find a difficulty in helping himself, they simplify matters for him as much as possible. As the dishes are not named when they are handed round, it is necessary to study the menu in order to know what they are. Some young people appear to think that it looks greedy to pay much attention to the information given on the dainty little bill of fare, but this, of course, is one of youth's delusions. I have seen a short-sighted young man straining his eyes in the endeavor to read furtively the names of the dishes on his menu. He would have done far better if he had boldly taken it up in his hand to examine it. However hungry one may be, the duty of keeping up a conversation must not be neglected. The viands must never be chosen as a topic for either praise or blame. If one knows a girl very well, one may ask, do you like sweets, or some such question, but it is safer with strangers to avoid the subject of the food provided. It is scarcely necessary to remark that drinking too much wine is a very bad phase of ill manners. At one time it was actually fashionable to become intoxicated after dinner, but those days are gone, I am thankful to say. The young man who exceeds in this way is soon made aware of the fact that he has given his hostess dire offense. He is never invited again, or not for a long time. The wine glass is never drained at a draught in polite society, nor is it considered polite to eat very quickly. The knife, fork, and spoon are handled as noiselessly as possible. Scraping the edge of the knife against the plate is unpardonable. It produces a grating noise that is excessively unpleasant. In sending a plate away to be replenished, the diner leaves his knife and fork or his spoon, as the case may be, upon it. In dealing with bread, use neither knife nor fork. It must be broken with the fingers. There is a story of an absent-minded and short-sighted prelate, who, with the remark, My bread, I think, dug his fork into the white hand of a lady who sat beside him. He had been badly brought up, or he would not have used his fork, and the white hand would have experienced nothing worse than a sudden grasp. It requires some expertness and practice for a man with a mustache to take soup in a perfectly inoffensive manner. The accomplishment is worth some trouble. Some men who should know better, and some women too, forget that the mouth should be kept closed while mastication is going on. This is a very important matter. Nature teaches us to keep the mouth open, as any one may see from the way in which children and uncultivated persons eat. But good manners enjoin upon us that to adopt the natural mode is to disgust and annoy those with whom we sit at meat. If these little things have not been learned in childhood, it is difficult to master them afterwards. Mothers should also teach their boys and girls never to speak while food is in the mouth, and never to drink until it is quite empty. Who would not be mortified if he were to choke ignominiously at the dinner table? The correct way to eat a curry is with a spoon and fork, but this is the only meat dish that is eaten in this way. Sweetbreads and many other entrees are eaten with the fork alone. It is then held in the right hand. Should a knife be found necessary, it can, of course, be used. Vegetable entrees are always eaten with a fork, held in the right hand. Fish is eaten with a silver or plated knife and fork. Sauces are never taken very plentifully. The sauce ladle filled will be generally sufficient. I once saw a man, in helping himself to oyster sauce, look scrutinizingly in the sauce boat and carefully fish about for as many oysters as he could collect in the ladle. This caused some covert amusement, except perhaps to the last persons to whom the sauce was handed. They probably found few oysters. Bread, biscuits, olives, asparagus, celery, and bonbons are the forms of food that may be touched with the fingers. They're used once to be a rule that a bone might be picked, if only the finger and thumb were used in holding it but that was in the days when table cutlery was far from having been brought to its present condition of perfection. 
there is now no excuse for handling bones. Knives and forks suffice, and it is only in the lowest grades of society that they are found inadequate. In helping oneself to salad, it must be placed on the crescent-shaped plate laid down for that purpose before it is handed round. This plate is put at the left side of the round plate. Both knife and fork are often necessary with salads, but if they are sent to table as they should be, with the lettuce and other vegetables broken small, the fork is quite sufficient. It is always disagreeable to see a steel knife used with vinegar, and it should be avoided whenever possible to do so. Oysters served on the shell are eaten with a fish knife and fork. Other fish hors d'oeuvres are eaten with a fish fork. It is not always possible to tell, either from the appearance or name of the hors d'oeuvres, whether it consists of fish or meat. In that case, it is safer to use an ordinary fork, and for this reason, the fish knife has been laid for a fish course, and if it should have been previously unnecessarily used for the hors d'oeuvres, it will be needful for the servant to bring another. Fish rissoles may be eaten with a fish fork only, in fact, any preparation that does not need the knife. It is a safe rule never to use either knife or spoon if the fork will do. With ice pudding, or ices in any form, a small spoon is used. Now let us take the dinner from the very beginning and go through the courses. First, there may be hors d'oeuvres, small morsels of various kinds which are found ready to hand when the guests sit down. I have already referred to these. Next comes soup, generally one thick and one clear. The attendant offers the diner a choice, and he must promptly make it. When it is set before him, he begins at once, not waiting till everyone is served. He takes up the tablespoon, placed already at his right hand, and it is not considered very good form to immediately put some salt into the soup before tasting it. People who pride themselves on the possession of a clever cook sometimes feel annoyed at the distrust of her powers shown in this simple action. With soup, small addenda are often handed. The guest helps himself to these, whether they are croutons, fried breadcrumbs, or other supplementary provision, with the spoon handed round on the dish. It is a very old-fashioned piece of good manners to wait till everyone is served. So old-fashioned is it that it survives at present only among the uncultured classes. The correct thing to do nowadays is to begin eating without reference to others. The old style must not only have been trying in consequence of seeing one's food grow cold before one's eyes, but it must also have been responsible for making dinner a very slow and tedious meal. Now the attendants remove the plates from the guest first helped Directly the fork is laid down, and this greatly accelerates the service. The soup plate, if tilted at all, is raised at the side nearest the eater, so that the soup collects at the furthest point from him. It is generally unnecessary to tilt the plate, however, but the thing to avoid is passing the left hand round it in a half embrace, and tilting it towards the eater. This is highly incorrect. It is also dangerous. The soup has been known to spill on the cloth and even over the diner. When the servant is removing your soup plate, he will sometimes ask, Any more, sir? To which you must reply in the negative. A shake of the head will suffice. Soup is never helped twice, nor is fish. This is the next course. Bread is always eaten with fish. I have already explained that a silver knife and fork are used. The sauce handed is almost invariably accepted. Sometimes the cruet is handed round, containing some sort of condiment suitable to the fish served. It is, of course, a matter of choice whether this be accepted or not. Very few diners work straight through a menu without omitting some dishes. The idea of giving so many is that there may be some to suit all tastes. No one is expected to take of all, though it is quite permissible to do so. After the soup and fish, the entrees are handed round. The dishes are presented at the left side of the diner, and he helps himself with his right hand, a tablespoon being placed on the dish for that purpose, 
or with both hands, using spoon and fork should the nature of the dish render this necessary. When slices from a joint or game or poultry are handed round, the vegetables, gravies, and sauces accompanying them are handed after. It is usual to wait for these etceteras before beginning upon the meat, fowl, venison, or game. For instance, no one would commence upon a slice of roast beef, or mutton without potatoes or gravy, nor upon a piece of peasant without browned bread crumbs, or bread sauce, or gravy. I say no one would do it, but I have seen it done, whether in absence of mind or from pressure of appetite, I cannot pretend to say. It is a mistake, however. Cheese is handed round after the sweets in order to prepare the palate for the enjoyment of dessert wines. This, at least, was the original meaning of introducing it at this stage of the meal. But now ice pudding, when served, follows it, thus contradictorily re-establishing the reign of sweets. Savories are handed round with a cheese course. These are eaten with a fork. Even a cheese fondue is eaten with a fork, though the cook occasionally fails to bring it to the requisite firmness of consistency, in which case it looks more suited to a spoon, but the fork must do. Celery is eaten with the fingers, like asparagus. This last named, by the way, if too much cooked and consequently very soft and unmanageable, may be eaten with the fork, but must not be touched with the knife. And again, should asparagus be served with the melted butter thrown over it, it must be eaten with a fork. It very seldom is so served, but I have met with this mode in some houses. Cheese ramekins are eaten with the fingers. Cheese itself is handed round on a dish or plate with the pieces cut ready to one's hand. The diner helps himself with the knife laid ready beside the pieces of cheese, not with his own knife. If watercress is handed round, it is taken up in the fingers and eaten in the same way. Cheese is cut in small pieces and conveyed to the mouth on a piece of bread or biscuit. Very few persons continue to eat it in the old-fashioned way by carrying it to the mouth with the knife. I have seen it taken up with the fingers, but as cheese is apt to smell rather strongly, it is better to avoid touching it. With regard to sweets, it is a safe rule to use the fork only when it suffices for the work in hand. With tarts, as a rule, both spoon and fork are necessary, especially when there is syrup. Cold tart can often be comfortably eaten with a fork. Jellies and creams are eaten with a fork only, ice pudding with an ice spoon or, failing that, a teaspoon. From the moment one has unfolded one's napkin, and place the bread it contained at one's left, there is nothing more to do that concerns the cover, as the preparation for each diner's convenience is called, until the dessert plate, with its doily, finger glass, silver knife, and fork, and perhaps ice plate and spoon in addition, is set down before one. Before the or dessert are handed round, one must place the dessert knife and fork at right and left, respectively of one's plate and taking up the finger glass carefully in one hand with the other place the doily on the cloth to the left of one's plate then setting the finger glass down upon it i say carefully because these glasses are often of the lightest possible kind and are occasionally of a costly description besides rough handling might tend to spill the water they contain with regard to the dessert fruits etc there are a few puzzles to be found among them for the inexperienced. Grapes present one of these. They are taken up singly, and afterwards the skin and seeds have to be expelled as unobtrusively as possible. It is a matter of great difficulty to accomplish this by any other method than using the hand. Therefore, this is the accepted custom. The forefinger is curved above the mouth in a manner which serves to conceal the ejectment, and the skin and seeds are in this way conveyed to the plate, the fingers being afterwards wiped with the napkin. Bananas are peeled with the knife and fork, and the pieces are conveyed to the mouth by means of the fork. Oranges are cut in two, then in four, and with the aid of knife and fork, the contents of each section are extracted in two or more parts, and carried to the lips on the fork. 
Apples and pears are peeled with the knife and fork, peaches, apricots, and nectarines in the same way. Strawberries are taken by the stem, dipped in sugar and cream, and carried to the lips with the fingers. If the fruit has been picked free of husks and stem, it may be bruised on the plate with sugar and cream, and eaten with a spoon. Preserved ginger is eaten with the knife and fork. A spoon is necessary with pines, melons, and very juicy strawberries, after they have been prepared with the knife and fork. Nuts are cracked with the nutcrackers, and then extracted by the fingers. With filberts and Brazil nuts, the knife and fork are called into requisition in order to free them from skin. But walnuts are too intricate for anything less wonderful in mechanism than the human hand. In view of this, they are sometimes prepared before being sent to table, and of late years they have been sold ready cracked and peeled for this purpose. Almonds are never sent to table in their shells, so that they present no difficulties to the novice. At dessert they are usually accompanied by raisins, which, like the almonds, are carried to the mouth in the fingers. Crystallized fruits are cut with the knife and fork, unless they happen to be of a small size, such as cherries. In that case, they are eaten whole, being carried to the lips on the fork. Liqueurs are handed round at dessert, poured out ready into the small glasses that are called after them. There is generally a choice, such as chartreuse or benedictine, sir, to which it is unnecessary to reply both please, as a historic young man did once. The servants often leave the dining room when the dessert is placed on the table, and when this is so, the wine is passed round from hand to hand, each gentleman attending first to the lady he has escorted, and then helping himself before passing on the decanter, claret jug, or champagne bottle. The good old fashion of using silver decanter stands has long disappeared, to the detriment of many a good tablecloth. So has the genial and hospitable fashion of drinking wine with one's guests, and they with each other. But this may be rather a good thing in the interests of temperance. Apropos to this subject, I may remark that there is now nothing singular in drinking nothing but water. The days are gone when a man was thought a milk sop because he could not drink his bottle, or if he refused wine or spirits. Should any young man prefer water, he asks for it when the servants offer him wine. He is then offered a polinaris, or distilled water, or soda water, or some other preparation of filtered and distilled water and may choose some of these in preference to plain water. Claret is the favorite dessert wine of the day, but port is still seen at some tables, and it is usual to offer champagne, as many prefer to drink only one kind of wine throughout the meal, from start to finish. In fact, this is becoming quite a fashion in some sets. The host provides cigars and cigarettes for his guests, and it would not be necessary or advisable to produce one's own supply. When the ladies rise to leave the dining room, the gentleman nearest the door opens the door for them, and stands beside it until they have all passed through, when he closes it after them. However anxious he may be to join them in the drawing room, he must not do so until the others make a move. Sometimes, if he is very young and rather out of it, when politics or sport are under discussion, his host says to him, I'm afraid you are bored. If you would like to join the ladies, don't stand on ceremony. But on the other hand, he may dread the ordeal of entering the drawing room alone and feel that the safer way is to wait for a convoy. This he must decide for himself. Perhaps his host may wish to talk confidentially with some other guest. If he makes this apparent to the younger man, the latter must accept any such intimidation as the above, understanding it to be a courteous mode of dismissing him. The ordinary rule is that the gentleman joins the ladies all together, the man of highest position leaving the dining room first, the host last. Tea is then carried round in the drawing room, and the gentlemen take the empty cups from the ladies and put them down in some safe place, out of the way of risk of accident. Should any lady sing or play, the gentleman nearest to her escorts her to the piano and helps her to arrange her music, to dispose of her gloves, fan, handkerchief, etc. It is scarcely etiquette for young men to leave first after a dinner party. 
It is more usual for the elders of the party to make the first move towards departure, but should the young man have an engagement of a pressing kind, such as a promise to escort ladies to a ball, he must withdraw in good time, explaining the position to his hostess. No one leaves after a dinner party without saying good night to his host and hostess, even in the case of an early departure. Before the gentlemen have left the dining room, the guest must visit the drawing room to make his adieu, not only to the lady of the house, but to any others who may be of his acquaintance. Those whom he has met for the first time that evening may be saluted with a parting bow. At a formal dinner party, the evening suit is imperative with a dress coat, white or black waistcoat, black trousers, and white tie. When dining with friends with whom one is on terms of familiarity, the dinner jacket may be substituted for the coat. Black ties often take the place of white. Patent leather shoes or boots must be worn. It would be unpardonable to appear in thick walking boots or shoes, and the necessity for immaculately polished footgear has cost the young man of the present day many a cab. His varnished shoes must show no trace of mud or dust. To tell the truth, he often carries a silk handkerchief in his pocket, wherewith to obliterate the traces of the latter. The pocket handkerchief used with evening dress must be of white chambric and of as good a color as one's washerwoman will permit. It ought to be of fine quality. The hair must be short and very well brushed. It used to be the custom to tip the servants on leaving the house where one had dined as a guest, but this has fallen into disuse. There are many men who hand a silver coin to the butler or footman or waiting maid who helps them into their coats, calls up their carriage, or hails a cab for them, seeing them into it or rendering any other service of a similar kind. This is a matter that each man must decide for himself. It is only necessary to remark that the custom of giving shillings or half-crowns to the servants after a dinner party no longer reigns, though there are always good-natured folk who will not let it absolutely die out. End of chapter 11 Recording by Jen Broda Chapter 12 of Manners for Men This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ruth Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey Chapter 12 Public Dinners The following information is supplied by a gentleman well known in the city and thoroughly au fait in such matters. Public dinners may be classed as those given by associations or public bodies and those given by institutions such as some of the great city companies. When given by an association the function is generally managed by a committee, who have the arrangement of all the details, such as choosing the menu, the wines, preparing the programme of music, instrument or vocal, and arranging the due sequence of the speeches. A guest invited to such an entertainment, who may not be of the few highly placed personages who sit at the cross table or on the dais, and from whom speeches are expected, will, on arriving at the hall, hotel or public institution selected, find that the first thing required of him will be his invitation card. In exchange for this, he will be handed a more or less elaborate menu card, which will also contain the list of music and a sketch showing the position of the guest seats at the tables. After depositing his hat and overcoat in the cloakroom, receiving a numbered ticket for them, he enters the reception or drawing room his name is announced and he passes into the room, goes up to the members of the committee who stand by themselves to receive the guests, bows or shakes hands and passes on to join the other guests, who are either sitting or standing in groups engaged in conversation. When dinner is announced, the hosts and the highest in rank of the guests file into the dining room and take up their position by their chairs, followed by the rest. Any clergyman present says grace on being asked to do so, and the banquet commences. Strangers sitting next to each other soon fall into conversation. 
and after the dispatch of the solid portion of the repast comes the speeches. Music is played at intervals, perhaps a few songs sung by professionals, then desserts, cigars and coffee, after which the guests find their way to the drawing-room for more general conversation, some preferring to leave without re-entering the drawing-room. In such large gatherings it is not necessary to take leave of their hosts as a rule. Dinners given by city companies are very much on the same principle. The guest has but to don his evening clothes and carry himself with easy composure, not always a simple matter to the inexperienced. If one may judge from the hurried steps and the sudden bob that many give on entering the reception room after arrival. At dinners, given on behalf of charities, it is well to go prepared with a subscription, as a collection is often made on these occasions. If not prepared to subscribe, it is more discreet to stay away. With regard to tips, the only ones really recognised are those for whom the plates and the cloakroom table are laid ready in expectation of small silver coins. Though no fees are actually necessary at table, the initiated person is well aware that the man behind his chair can administer to his wants and see that he is liberally provided with viands and wines or other matters without keeping him waiting longer than necessary. A tip quietly conveyed before the dinner is under way is not by any means wasted. It sometimes happens that semi-official dinners are given at private houses when proprietors of newspapers or wealthy men interested in certain undertakings entertain the staff of those employed. In such circumstances it may be as well to warn the guests against addressing the footman as waiter. This may appear to be superfluous advice, but I myself have been present when the mistake was made, evidently to the intense indignation of the magnificent being thus addressed. At such dinners as these, the host treats his guests as his social equals for the nonce. By having invited them to his house, he places himself in a position of regarding them as he would his own friends at his dinner table. Any infraction of this would be in the worst taste. It is also usual to abstain from any business talk at such times as these, the conversation being encouraged to dwell on general topics. Though the fiction of social equality is maintained by the host, the guests need not adopt a familiar, free and easy manner in response. True manliness involves sufficient self-respect to preserve the possessor from falling into this error. But it is perhaps a little difficult for the novice on such occasions to bear himself in such wise as to avoid undue familiarity on one hand and an air of stiffness and standoffishness on the other. In his anxiety not to appear to presume upon the friendliness of his host's manner, he is apt to wear a rather repellent air, and this is more particularly so when the employee is by birth the equal, if not the superior, of his entertainer. It often happens that a man at the head of a great business has risen from obscure beginnings to the command of wealth and a high position in the world, enjoying a title and many of the extraneous advantages of rank. Among those whom he employs may be several who are his social superiors in all but wealth. But any of them who imagine that this fact gives them any claim upon his consideration or entitles them to converse with him upon a footing of equality make a radical mistake. Their position as regards their employer is exactly that justified by their standing in his firm. The true gentleman is well aware of this and would never dream of inserting himself in any way on the strength of being well born or highly educated. He leaves all that kind of thing to the man who feels his claim to gentlemanhood to be so shadowy and insecure as to need constant insistence. Besides, the host is usually the elder and deference to seniority is an important part of good manners and sits extremely well upon the young. End of chapter 12. Recording by Ruth. Chapter 13 of Manners for Men. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 13 At a Restaurant when accompanying ladies who express a wish for refreshment it is not necessary to select a very expensive restaurant or confectioners one suitable to the social status of the party should be chosen the young man must pay for what his companions eat and drink and very often this is a most embarrassing matter he may have enough money in his pocket to defray the bill and he may not in any case he is often unable to afford it but the probabilities are that if he has the wherewithal about him he will pay in order to extricate himself from an awkward predicament even though he may consequently be crippled financially for some days to come if he has only two or three shillings in his pocket he feels extremely uncomfortable no well-bred woman or girl would ever place an acquaintance on the horns of such a dilemma but unfortunately there are many girls and women who are lacking in taste and refinement and who would regard it as an excellent joke to play such a trick upon a fellow as they would probably call him and enjoy his discomfort the best thing to do in such a case is to be perfectly frank and open i'm extremely sorry but i have not sufficient cash with me for the purpose it is very disagreeable to have to say so but it is less mortifying than to have to acknowledge it to the waiter at the restaurant a young man told me that he had once in such a case to leave the table on pretense of speaking to the proprietor and fly round to a pawnbroker's to pledge his watch a really well-bred girl or woman would make it clear that she intended to pay for her own meal and that only on that condition would she accept the escort of the young man sometimes after a run on a bicycle or a hot walk a young man will say to his sister and her friend come in and have an ice if the friend is one of the unscrupulous sort she will very probably run him into what for him is a considerable expense he must pay it however and the worst of it is that he cannot sit there and let her eat all by herself even his sister should she be present must in good manners join in to a certain extent otherwise the implied reproof would be too obvious for good breeding End of chapter thirteen Chapter 14 of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 14 At Lunch. Luncheon is a comparatively informal meal. The guests do not pair off, as at dinner, but on the meal being announced, the host, if there be one, would open the door for the ladies, who would go downstairs, followed by the hostess, the gentleman behind her. Very often the master of the house is absent at luncheon, in which case the hostess would rise, and, addressing her principal guest, would propose to her to lead the way downstairs. Shall we go to lunch? Mrs. So-and-so would be sufficient. The other ladies would probably be sufficiently versed in the laws of society to refrain from preceding those of higher position, and the hostess would always be the last lady to leave the drawing room. The guests sit down where they please, the host or hostess sometimes making a suggestion on the matter. After the meal, the guests return to the drawing room, but only for a short time. The gentlemen resume their overcoats and take their hats and umbrellas in the hall where they had left them. Should a man make a call at luncheon time, he is often asked to remain for the meal. In that case, he would carry his hat and stick into the dining room with him, just as he would if making an ordinary call. But it is much better never to call anywhere at lunchtime unless one is on very familiar terms with the family. Many young men acquire a reputation for cadging for lunch or dinner in this way. Invitations from the younger members of the family are not official, unless plainly endorsed by the elders, or one of them. Miss Lucy invited me to lunch is a poor plea. Frank asked me to come and dine this evening is no better. 
young men cannot be too particular about this matter i'll get my mother to ask you to dinner old man would be the safer sort of invitation the lady of the house must fix the date and she usually writes the invitation herself or gives it personally should a daughter of the house give a young man an invitation to any meal without reference to her father or mother it would be incorrect in the highest degree to accept it as to children their invitations go for nothing of course though cases have been known in which they have been accepted i met little eddie in the park and he made me come in with him this has a very poor and pitiable sound at luncheon hour or tea time it is not necessary to make one's adieu to each guest in turn the hostess is taken leave of first as a rule and the lady or ladies with whom one has been conversing will expect a special word and bow perhaps offering a hand but a general bow will be sufficient for those to whom one is not very well known it is only at family parties that one has conscientiously to go round the room shaking hands with everybody End of chapter 14、Chapter 15 An afternoon at homes. Gentlemen are in great request at five o'clock tea. Their duties are rather onerous if there are but one or two men and the usual crowd of ladies. They have to carry teacups about, hand sugar, cream, and cakes or muffins, and keep up all the time a stream of small talk, as amusing as they can make it. They must rise every time a lady enters or leaves the room, opening the door for her exit if no one else is nearer to it. And if his hostess requests him, he must see the lady downstairs to her carriage or cab. With regard to the viands, a man helps himself, but not till he has seen that all the ladies in his vicinity have everything they can possibly want. His hostess, or some lady deputed by her to preside at the tea table, gives him tea or coffee, and he adds sugar and cream. With regard to afternoon at homes, the arrangements are quite different. Invitations are sent out a fortnight or three weeks before, generally the latter, and in the height of the season even longer. Suppose the young man's name to be Edward Smith. His invitation would be as follows Mr. Edward Smith, Lady Dart, at home, Tuesday, November 3rd, 4 to 7, 12, Evergreen Square, RSVP. He replies on a sheet of note paper. Mr. Edward Smith has much pleasure in accepting Lady Dart's kind invitation for Tuesday afternoon, November 3rd. It's a great mistake to write. We'll have much pleasure in accepting. Accepting is the action of the present moment while he is writing the reply. We'll have refers to the future and is therefore unsuitable. The answering of invitations is a simple matter enough, but it is a test of good breeding. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 16 At the Play. At a theater, The underbred man is often in evidence, not only in the low priced seats, but also all over the house. He has been seen and heard in private boxes. A well known music hall celebrity administered a scathing reproof to one of these, who persisted in talking loudly while she was singing. Stopping short, she looked up at the box in which he sat and cried, One fool at a time, please, after which he was as quiet as a mouse. It is a piece of bad manners to enter the theater late, disturbing the audience and annoying the players or singers. It is equally rude to leave before the entertainment is ended, unless the interval be chosen when nothing is going on. At a concert, this is particularly true, for there are devotees of music who hang upon every note 
and to whom it is a distinct loss to miss a single phrase of the compositions they have come to hear singers actors and actresses generally possess the sensitive sympathetic artistic temperament and it is wounding to them to see members of the audience fidgeting rustling about chattering laughing and otherwise showing inattention when they are doing their best to entertain them it is therefore uncivil to betray inattention a little appreciation goes a long way with the members of the professions of music and the drama an actor told me once that after having made a certain speech two or three times without any sign of amusement from the audience on the fourth night of the play a single silvery note of musical mirth was heard from the stalls it was but one note say e flat on the treble clef but the audience immediately joined in perceiving the point of the speech as though it had been illuminated for them by this one little laugh he declared that ever after that night his formerly unsuccessful lines elicited a roar of laughter probably this was partly due to the sense of encouragement he felt inspiring him to do emphasis in taking ladies to a place of entertainment a gentleman hands them into their carriage a cab or an omnibus getting in last arrived at their destination the gentleman alights first handing out the ladies and giving any necessary orders to the coachman or paying the cabman's fare by the way it is always as well to give instructions to the coachman about where he is to be found and at what hour he is to pick up his party before entering the carriage as policemen view with much disfavor any prolonged dialogue outside a place of entertainment where vehicles are setting down their occupants in quick succession should there be a footman of course all these difficulties are obviated as he can carry the instructions to the coachman and also knows where to find the carriage when the performance is over should a hired brougham be used as a conveyance in going to any place of entertainment or even a party at a private house it is an excellent plan to give the coachman a bright colored handkerchief scarlet or orange perhaps that he may wear it conspicuously displayed and can in this way be at once recognized it is a miserable business on a wet night to hunt for a brougham up and down ill-lighted streets when in evening dress and patent leather boots and anything that tends to shorten the task is advisable nor do ladies enjoy waiting in the draughty vestibule of opera houses theatre or concert room for an indefinite period while a short-sighted cavalier is groping about the streets for their carriage if it is a question of a cab the commissionaire at the door is the best person to get one which he will do for a small fee here again a word of warning as needed there are men who in their special care of the ladies in their charge forget that it is no part of the duty of a gentleman to ignore the claims of other women who have not the advantage of belonging to their party i have seen men who ought to have known better rudely pushing other ladies away from the door of a cab or railway carriage in order that their own womankind may be well looked after it is all very well to be attentive and anxious to do one's best but it is ill-bred to the last degree to subject to rudeness any ladies who happen to be without a gentleman to look after them retribution followed very swiftly in one instance of the kind at sandown station one day the second special train for waterloo was coming in and the platform was crowded with gaily dressed women tired and hot after the walk across the fields on a tropical july day a lady and small eton boy were together and suddenly when about to open the door of a carriage at the moment the train came to a standstill found themselves all but thrown down by a sweeping motion of the arm of a young man who was bent on reserving that particular carriage for his party without a word of apology to the lady he shouted to his sisters and friends to come on still holding back the two who had wished to get in they entered the next compartment and as they did so the lady remarked to her companion what an extremely ill-mannered person that is meanwhile the party next door were settling down and congratulating themselves on having secured seats when one of them turned to their overzealous friend and remarked i saw lady blank get into the next carriage with her eldest boy who he asked with a sudden and remarkable rush of color on his face the lady to whom he had behaved so rudely 
turned out to be one from whom he had that very morning received a long-desired invitation to spend a few days at her country house in the following month this he owed to the good offices of a friend in the f o and delighted at having made such a step in his social career he had at once written off accepting the invitation it is scarcely necessary to add that he never made the visit but had to wire at the last moment one of those conventional excuses that the unco gid called fibs but which are only the transparent devices adopted by society to lubricate some of the more difficult of its processes between the acts of a play the modern man thinks it his duty to himself to go out and have a drink perhaps smoke a cigarette there was a time when had any such suggestion been made to a gentleman who had constituted himself the escort of a lady he would have asked though perhaps not in milton's words and leave thy fair side all unguarded lady but now the majority of young men visit the bar or the foyer but who shall say what golden opinions are won by those who do not follow the custom who refrain from acquiring the odor of tobacco or whiskey or brandy while they are in the company of ladies in the heated atmosphere of a theater a lady sometimes says to the men of her party i see that there is a general stampede going on don't mind me if you would like to go out if they go she thinks oh they are just like the rest if they stay she says to her own heart how delightful it is to find a man who can do without a b and s or a smoke for two or three hours and up he goes many pegs in her estimation apart from the lady he is with and considerations connected with her there is the inconvenience to which many of the audience are subjected by the passing in and out of so many however it is a recognized custom so much so that a smoking foyer is attached to all the best theatres and a warning bell is rung in it by the management a few minutes before the rising of the curtain refreshments are frequently carried round by attendants to private boxes and sometimes in the stalls as well should they appear it is the duty of the gentlemen of the party to ask the lady or ladies if they wish for any and to pay for what is consumed it is however a rare thing for ladies to eat or drink at the play the gentleman also pays for the program at the few theatres where a charge is made i may mention by the way that it is not considered very good form to pay for programs at theatres where the management makes no charge instances have been known where attendants have been discharged for accepting such fees and even apart from this it is tantamount to presenting the attendant with sixpence or a shilling if one insists on paying for a program or two provided free of charge many of the attendants are superior to accepting it end of chapter sixteen Chapter 17 of Banners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 17 At a Ball. The etiquette of the ballroom is not difficult to acquire, and yet there are thousands of young men going into society constantly who flagrantly fail in it their bad manners are conspicuous they decline to dance unless the prettiest girls in the room are trotted out for them block the doorways haunt the refreshment room and after supper promptly take their leave could any course of conduct be in worse taste and what can a poor hostess do young men are necessary at dances and they must be invited if they will not dance who shall make them the delight of the average hostess's heart is the well-bred man unspoiled by conceit who can always be depended on to do his duty he arrives in good time fills his card before very long and can be asked to dance with a plain neglected wallflower or two without resenting it he takes his partner duly to the refreshment room after each dance if she wishes to go and provides her with whatever she wishes before leaving her he sees her safe at her chaperone's side if he should sit out a dance he returns in time to claim his partner for the next not leaving her till it is half over as is the wont of some young men 
the truth is that society demands a never-ending series of self-denying actions from those who belong to it and the more cheerfully these are performed the more perfect are the manners what can be more enjoyable than to sit in some cool retreat with a charming girl enjoying one of those innocent flirtations that do so much to give zest to life but delightful though it be the temptation to prolong it must be resisted if an expectant partner is missing her dance and waiting in the ballroom to be claimed it is bad manners to go to a ball unless one is accomplished in the art of dancing to do so is to take the place of one who may be more expert and therefore in greater request consequently every man who wishes to be a success in society must learn to dance there are abundant opportunities for doing so at the various dancing academies as they are rather unsuitably entitled for there is not much about them of the academical as generally understood private lessons are dearer than the others but they really are necessary for most men who have not been taught to dance when boys the whole attention of the teacher should be given during the first three or four a man has so much to learn in addition to the correct movements of his feet he must be taught to hold his head up to grasp his partner gently but firmly not to tread on her toes or knock his knees against hers and also how to steer his course and hers in an imaginary crowded room afterwards come the finishing touches when perfect in the steps and carriage of the body the learner is taught to glide gently from foot to foot regulating his pace as quickly or as slowly as he may wish at first this seems to be impossible for the novice is inclined to rush his fences as it were and he waltzes round the room at breakneck speed making himself giddy and breathless and sometimes causing dire catastrophe a girl finds it difficult to forgive a man who has made her look ridiculous the fall of a couple is not a frequent occurrence in a ballroom but when it does happen it is almost always the man's fault girls take much more naturally to the graceful movements of the dance and are besides more often taught in childhood than their brothers at a private ball the guest enters and greets his hostess before speaking to anyone else she shakes hands with him and passes him on to someone to introduce him to partners perhaps her husband perhaps her son with this beginning he will probably get on very well and may half fill his card and he should take care to do so at once for at some balls the nice girls are immediately snapped up and engaged for even the extras before they have been twenty minutes in the room are you engaged for every dance miss gray can you spare me one and miss gray probably gives him one but if he is a stranger of whose calisthenic prowess nothing is known she is careful to give him only one sometimes his partners if they discover that he dances well introduce him to their sisters and friends if however he should find himself left high and dry towards the end of the evening he should go back to the gentlemen of the house and ask them to introduce him to somebody else young men of experience in such matters usually manage very well without this but the novice has often to face the alternative of dancing no more or asking to be introduced hostesses sometimes make special introductions for the supper dance the one immediately preceding that meal this means that the man introduced unless engaged to dance it with someone else is imperatively called upon to accept the partner offered him and to take her down to supper in asking a lady to dance it is usual to say will you give me this waltz or may i have this barn dance some young men say would you like to dance this come along then but such a form of address is only suited to intimates when the dance is over and the partner left with her friends the man says thank you bows and leaves her if he wishes to see any lady to her carriage he asks her permission to do so folds her wraps around her hands her in and stands until the carriage has gone some yards away end of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jervis International. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. 
Chapter 18, Engagement in Marriage. The old-fashioned rule that a man must approach the father of a girl before offering himself in marriage to her has now to some extent died out. A man may not propose when her family object. At the same time, it is considered dishonorable for anyone to propose to a girl in the face of the decided disapprobation of her family. Clandestine courtship is also regarded as dishonorable, except in certain circumstances where the girl is unhappy or oppressed and needs a champion. Proposal in person. The usual way to ask for the admired one's hand in marriage is in person. This is always preferable to writing, though some men have not the courage to adopt the first course. Asking the father's permission. Should the lady accept the offer, the happy wooer must take the earliest opportunity of seeing her father, or failing him, her nearest friend, and begging him to permit the engagement. Should he consent, all is well. But in the contrary case, his decision must be accepted. To allow a girl to engage herself against the wish of her family is to drag her into a false position. Should the father refuse consent? Very often, submission to the decree affects more towards procuring its reversal than violent opposition. It is difficult, of course, for young people to be patient. But if they could only manage a little of it, they would find the truth of the French proverb, all things come round to those who know how to wait. The engagement ring. Immediately upon having the engagement ratified, the accepted suitor gives the lady an engagement ring. This should be as handsome a present as he can afford to buy, together with all other presents and correspondence on both sides. This ring must be returned if the engagement should be broken off. One's duty to one's betrothed. The accepted man is in duty bound to spend most of his leisure with his intended bride. He must not go off for a sojourn abroad while she is spending some weeks by the sea in England unless she has expressed a wish to that effect. It would be a considerable snub to her to do so. A significant announcement. Society has sometimes been amused by the announcement one day of a marriage having been arranged between Mr. A and Miss B and on the next of the intention of Mr. A to start for a tour round the world. This almost always means that the man has been entrapped into a proposal and would willingly retreat if he honorably could. Such things happen only too often. Maneuvering mothers have much to answer for in the matter. Worldly girls have often sufficient wisdom of the serpent to bring a reluctant wooer to the point and by immediately announcing the engagement to their friends to make it extremely difficult for him to retreat. Sometimes a girl falls so wildly in love with a man that she creates a kind of corresponding through passing fervor in him and while it lasts he believes himself in love though his emotions are only a mixture of gratified vanity and that physical attraction which needs true love to redeem it from the fleshly sort. When a girl takes the initiative, should marriage follow upon such courtship as these, where the girl takes ever the initiative, the union is very seldom a happy one. The woman never feels sure that her husband really loves her or would have chosen her. She knows that he was her choice rather than she his, and a wrecking jealousy seizes her and makes her not only miserable herself, but a very uncomfortable companion for him. The unhappy sequel. He too often finds when it is too late that she fulfills none of his ideals and is in many ways a contrast to the girl he would have chosen if she had not whirled him into the vortex of her own strong feelings. And he occasionally wonders if she may not someday experience a similar strength of attraction for some other man and let herself be carried away by it as she had been by her feeling for him. 
Hot fires soon burn out, he thinks, and remembers the warning given to Othello. She hath deceived her father and may thee. Long engagements. No man should drag a girl into a long engagement, nor should any man propose to a girl until he is in a position to provide for her. And unsuitable positions. He is only standing in the way of other wooers who may be well supplied with this world's gear. Such trifes as wealth and ease may appear as a naught to the mind of the youthful lover, not to be weighed for a moment in the balance with love and young romance. The girl, too, may be of the same way of thinking at the time, but it the more behooves a man, the stronger, to consider her and to remember that poverty is such a bitter and a cruel thing that it even kills love at times. A man's duty to look at cold facts. Recrimination in the home is a hard thing to bear, and yet how many millions of women since the world began have said to their husband, Oh, why did I ever marry you? I could have done so much better. And how many men have said to their wives, Well, you were determined to have me, so now you must make the best of me. However, we will suppose these rocks and quicksands passed, the engaged couple happy, and the wedding day at hand. The bridegroom's obligation. Custom demands that the bridegroom shall present her bouquet to the bride, as well as bouquets and present each to the bride's maids. He must furnish the house for the bride in every detail, not excepting the house and the table linen, which in the old days of spinning wheel was wont to be contributed by the bride herself, the best man. He must provide the wedding ring and the carriage in which his best man and himself go to church. He pays the fees to the clergyman and clerk, but it is the best man who hands them over. With him, the bridegroom waits at the altar till the bride arrives. She takes her place at his left hand for the first time, and at the proper moment, he produces the ring, which is the symbol of their union. The bridegroom's dress. The usual dress of a bridegroom consists of a very dark blue frock coat, light trousers, light or white scarf tie, patent boots, and a new hat. End of chapter 18. Recording by Jervis International. Chapter 19 of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 19. Dress. It is absolutely true, though in a very limited sense, that the tailor makes the man. If a man does not dress well in society, he cannot be a success. If he commits flagrant errors in costume, he will not be invited out very much. Of that he may be certain. If he goes to a garden party in a frock coat and straw hat, he is condemned more universally than if he had committed some crime. The evidence of the latter would not be upon him for all men to read, as the evidence of his ignorance in social forms is, in his mistaken notions of dress. Things are more involved than ever in the sartorial line, since so many new sports and pastimes have sprung up for men. A man cannot consult his tailor upon every trifling detail, even if his tailor were always a perfectly reliable authority, which is not always the case, for there are tailors and tailors. A young man's finances do not always allow him to go to one of the best, and the second and third-rate artists in cloth are apt to purvey second- and third-rate fashions to their customers. A brief summary of the forms of dress appropriate to various occasions may be of some use to the inexperienced. It is obvious that to enter into detail would be out of place in a matter where change is the order of the day. But there are certain fixed rules that are, in a sense, permanent, and with these I may succinctly deal. For morning wear, the morning coat or jacket or the tweed suit is correct. 
After lunch, when in town, the well-dressed man may continue to wear his morning coat or the regulation frock coat with trousers of some neat striped gray mixture. The tailor's name for the material of these is mixed cheviots. It is not considered good form to wear very light trousers except on special occasions, such as weddings, garden parties, or afternoon assemblies of a festive kind. Even then, it is better to err on the quiet side than to be over loud. The days of broadcloth have long gone by, and coats are now made of vicuna cloth or black twilled worsteds with a dull finish and of an elastic quality. Waistcoats may be single or double-breasted. There is no restriction as to the color of the tie. The park suit may consist of a gray or light brown frock coat with waistcoat and trousers to match, and this is the usual dress for Ascot, the smartest of all the races. At Sandown, the low hat and tweed suit or long racing coat are worn, except on such days as the Princess of Wales is present, when the prince sets the example of wearing a black coat and silk hat, and all other men are expected to follow his example. For a morning walk in the park in summer, the straw hat or low hat and tweed suit are as correct as the black coat and silk hat, but it must be remembered that a straw hat or low hat cannot be worn with a black coat of any kind. The pot hat and brown boots are permissible with an overcoat, under which there may be a tweed suit, but brown boots may not otherwise accompany a black coat, though they are admissible with the ascot suit. There are special suits for all kinds of outdoor amusements, such as shooting, golfing, tennis, boating, driving, riding, bicycling, fishing, hunting, etc., but into the details of these it is unnecessary to enter. It may be remarked, however, that it is easy to stultify the whole effect of these, however perfectly they may be built by the tailor, by the addition of a single incongruous article of attire, such as a silk hat or patent boots with a shooting suit. The dress coat is no longer made of broadcloth, the shiny finish of which would now have a very old-fashioned appearance. The ordinary evening coat is made of an elastic twill cloth with a dull finish. Its elasticity makes it fit to perfection when cut by a good tailor. Of course, it would be incorrect to wear other than black trousers with it. The waistcoat is much cut away to show a wide expanse of immaculately got-up shirt front. This is the only correct costume for evening wear on all occasions of a formal nature. The dinner jacket has very largely superseded the dress coat for home wear, and at dinners in houses where one is a familiar guest, it is occasionally seen at the play, too, but it would be incorrect to wear it when accompanying ladies. Etiquette is not now nearly so strict as it used to be in the matter of evening dress in the stalls, private boxes, and dress circle of the theaters. I think this is rather to be deplored, but the wave of democracy that has poured over society of late has left its impress in this as in other matters. Though theater managers put on the tickets special to the best seats, evening dress, I have seen half a dozen men in the stalls dressed in a variety of unorthodox fashions, and once in August I even saw a man in a boating suit come in, straw hat in hand, and, ushered by an unprotesting attendant, take his seat. In the off-season, when all the fashionable people are out of town, this was not, perhaps, very surprising. But he must have been a courageous young man. Mourning for men seems almost a dead letter nowadays, except in the first two or three weeks after bereavement. A widower's mourning is not worn for more than a couple of months, unless the widower should belong to the numerous class who cling conservatively to old customs, and believe that to doff his weeds would imply some disrespect to his late wife. Disraeli, in his Endymion, puts the following words in the mouth of Mr. Vigo, the great tailor. Dress does not make a man, but it often makes a successful one. The most precious stone, you know, must be cut and polished. I have known many an heiress lost by her suitor being ill-dressed. You must dress according to your age, your pursuits, your object in life. You must dress, too, in some cases, according to your set. In youth, a little fancy is rather expected, but if political life be your object, 
it should be avoided, at least after one and twenty. I am dressing two brothers now, men of considerable position. One is a mere man of pleasure, the other will probably be a minister of state. They are as alike as two peas, but were I to dress the dandy and the minister the same, it would be bad taste, it would be ridiculous. No man gives me the trouble which Lord Eglantine does. He has not made up his mind whether he will be a great poet or a prime minister. You must choose, my lord, I tell him. I cannot send you out looking like Lord Byron if you mean to be a canning or a pit. What all men should avoid is the shabby genteel. No man ever gets over it. I will save you from that. You had better be in rags. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter Twenty. Country Life. Dress in the country varies considerably in many matters from that worn in town. A boy's first country suit after he leaves school is a great event to him. At Eton and Harrow the style of dress might almost be called a uniform, and the first suit of tweeds marks the emancipation from school life. When in the country he dons these the first thing in the morning, unless he should be on hunting or bicycling forts in tent, or should incline toward tennis, boating, or the slow delights of angling. After lunch, a change has occasionally to be made. Should a garden party be in question, he may take his choice between tweed suit and low hat or cutaway coat with silk hat. If he happens to be great on tennis, the tweed suit would not be naturally his choice, unless it were distinctly understood that the game would form a prominent feature of the afternoon's entertainment. In this case, flannel should be worn. Sometimes very ceremonious garden parties take place in the country when royalty or distinguished persons are expected to be present, when the frock coat and its usual accompaniments would not be out of place. Invitations to breakfast in the country are by no means unusual. The dress will consist of that ordinarily worn in the mornings, whether tweed suit, knickerbockers, hunting or riding gear, or the black morning coat or suit. Frequently a silk hat is never seen between Sunday and Sunday. Churchgoers still to a certain extent affect it, but in these days of outdoor life, bicycling and so on, the costume worn by men in church is experiencing the same modifications that characterise it in other departments. The details of shooting suits can always be studied in the illustrated advertisements of the tailors. A man's wardrobe is now almost as varied as a woman's. He has different costumes for walking, riding, driving, visiting, boating, hunting, shooting, golfing, bicycling, tennis and cricket, dining, smoking and lounging, football, racing and yachting. To say nothing of uniform and court suit, besides the now developing motor car costume. End of chapter 20 Recording by Ruth Chapter 21 of Manners for Men This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by phone Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey Chapter 21 Visiting Cards and Calls It is necessary for every young man to have a supply of visiting cards, and for these there is one fixed rule, any departure from which betokens want of knowledge of the customs of well-bred people. The size must be exactly three inches by one and a half. The pasteboard must be pure white and glossy, and the lettering must be in italic. 
an idea prevails among young men of a certain class that it is incorrect to put the title mister before their own name on a visiting card this is a great mistake not to put it is to show oneself lacking in savoir faire the name must always be preceded by mister or sir or other title the address must occupy the left-hand corner and the name of one's club or clubs must follow it when a young man has no permanent address it is well to have only his name printed filling in the address in pencil before leaving or presenting his card the hours for calling are from four to seven in the afternoon but young men who are not on very intimate terms with the family should carefully abstain from calling after six o'clock lest they should be the last and solitary caller when the door is opened and the question is mrs blank at home answered in the affirmative the visitor is invited to follow the servant he may take off his overcoat if he wishes but he must carry his hat and stick in his hand the right hand glove must be removed the gloved hand is never given to a lady certain exceptional circumstances proving the rule arrived in the drawing-room he holds his hat and glove in the left hand greets hostess first she shaking hands with him and then he looks round the room and greets any acquaintance he may recognize going up to them if he knows them well bowing if his previous knowledge of them has been slight having taken his seat he still holds his hat in his hand and he must find small talk as best he can for sitting silent is awkward for him and distressing to his hostess she by the way will probably say would you not like to put down your hat indicating some spot where he may lay it the reason of carrying the hat to the drawing-room is a somewhat subtle one it is based on the supposition that the masculine caller feels himself privileged in being permitted to pay his respects and feeling himself on sufferance is ready to leave in a moment hat in hand should he not find his presence agreeable and acceptable i have a private theory that this custom is cherished and kept up by men from a conviction that their hats are much safer in their own sight in the drawing-room than they would be downstairs in the hall new umbrellas have been taken instead of old as we all know and new hats are quite as tempting if not more so do not send your card up when making a call this is reserved for business men the servant asks your name and it must be given very distinctly it will then be announced in a loud clear voice when the door is opened should the hostess show by her manner that she has not recognized the name its owner must recall himself to her memory by saying i am mr so-and-so i had the pleasure of etc etc explaining the circumstances that led to the call the visiting card must be left on the hall table when the caller goes away one card for the ladies of the house and one for the gentleman or gentlemen whether these latter have been present or absent during the call should the lady called on be not at home the cards are given to the servant when a man has rendered an unknown lady some really important service as in the case of a street accident or some other disagreeable circumstance in which he has been able to avert from her some unpleasantness which she would have otherwise incurred the lady will probably ask him to let her know to whom she is indebted for so much kindness the proper course to pursue is to disclaim any special obligation but if the lady persists it is then good manners to give the name should the gentleman feel very much interested in the lady he may say i should very much like to call to-morrow to find out if you are none the worse for your adventure she may then give him her address and he would give her his card but this would all be very much out of place if the affair had been some mere matter of common courtesy such as picking up some article dropped by a lady and restoring it to her 
a gentleman in such circumstances raises his hat and retires as quickly as possible lest the lady should imagine that he could base a claim to her acquaintance on the performance of so trivial a service it is only the cad who thus presumes and the cadess who allows him to do so visiting cards are never sent by post they denote a call in person the only exception to this rule is in sending out ppc cards these are always sent by post the letters denote pour prendre congé to take leave and are used when it is found impossible to call and say good-bye to all one circle of acquaintance a call after a ball or dinner party must be made within the week and cards left in calling to inquire after the welfare of an invalid or after the family has suffered bereavement cards are always left if a man is on intimate terms with a family that has suffered bereavement he sometimes uses cards with a slight line of black and should he write a letter of condolence note paper and envelopes with the same slight indication of mourning on them this expresses sympathy and a personal share in the sorrow felt in making a call after death has visited any family the dress of the caller should be attuned to the occasion and should be of a sombre colour though it need not be precisely mourning when a man is a frequent visitor to any house he may leave his hat and stick in the hall the umbrella is never taken into a drawing-room cards must be left after an invitation whether the latter be accepted or not in case of not wishing to pursue the acquaintance of the person who sent the invitation it is sufficient to leave the cards without inquiring whether the lady is at home if a man should wish for any reason to courteously end an acquaintanceship he can do it without any of the intolerable cutting a method resorted to only by the rough and uncultivated he may make a call that in his own mind he knows to be a final one remaining only just the quarter of an hour that is the minimum length of such functions and preserving a certain gravity of demeanour which is as free from sulks as it is from other forms of bad temper after this he may leave cards once more without asking if the ladies of the family are at home in this way he can gradually and with perfect courtesy break off the intimacy in the street he raises his hat but does not stop to speak it is quite possible to ignore the attempt to do so on the opposite side but should circumstances be such as to make it difficult to do so without positive rudeness he must stop putting an end to the conversation at the earliest possible moment a call should never extend over half an hour unless the caller be expressly requested to prolong it a gentleman never looks at his watch during a call at a dinner party afternoon reception or ball this is prohibited because the inference would be that time was dragging with him and that he was anxious to get away a man may feel such anxiety but he must hide it if he would be deemed well-bred young men who do not pay their duty call and leave a card after any entertainment are likely to be omitted from the list of guests invited on some succeeding occasion occasionally it happens that a young man finds himself dropped by some family with whom he has been on terms of intimacy he is debarred by the rules of polite society from asking for an explanation it being a canon of good breeding never to ask questions that are embarrassing to reply to this has been embodied in a very outspoken and unceremonious phrase you ask me no questions i tell you no lies there is a deep truth in it nevertheless and even in family life it is well to observe it sometimes the reason a young man is dropped in this way is that something to his disadvantage has been discovered but not unfrequently the true reason is that one of the daughters of the house has shown a preference for his society which the parents think should be checked 
girls of the present day do not always exercise the well-bred self-control that is the rule of good society in such matters to love unsought is a misfortune for any girl leading inevitably to much mortification and humiliation but these may be minimized if she can only practice a dignified reticence about her feelings but should a young man thus capriciously as it seems to him be left out in the cold be on sufficiently good terms with a son of the house it would be quite in rule for him to put out a feeler or two on the subject i say old fellow i wonder if i have been so unfortunate as to offend your people in any way he will soon discover from the aspect of his interlocutor whether he is likely to gain any information on the matter calls of inquiry in calling on friends who have suffered bereavement after having received their card of thanks for kind inquiries it is of course requisite that the dress should be of the quietest description a red tie for instance would be horribly out of place only in case of very intimate friendships is the call prolonged beyond ten minutes or a quarter of an hour the caller takes his tone from that of the family it is in the worst taste to refer to the loss sustained unless the initiative is taken by one of those bereaved this is very seldom done and the conversation is usually conducted on lines calculated to avert any disturbing remark no one likes to break down or lose self-command except in seclusion and in fact it is only necessary to look into one's own consciousness in order to discover what is the best course to follow in such cases should a young man be invited to attend the funeral he must wear mourning black gloves and black hatband punctuality important at all times is particularly essential at this dreary ceremonial the family usually provides carriages but in the case of friends who possess equipages they always take their own it is the custom to assemble at the house or to go by fixed train should the family reside in the country it is better not to accept any invitations to return to the house afterwards for as a rule these are only given as a matter of form we often see in newspapers after the announcement of a death a request that no flowers may be sent failure to comply with this would argue a want of perception but when no such intimation is made a friend may send flowers the only essential being that they should consist as a rule of pure white flowers or orchids pansies or violets occasionally an exception is made to these in the case of favourite flowers of the lost friend an exquisite garland of pale tea-roses appeared among the scores of wreaths seen at the funeral of one of our greatest poets End of chapter 21 recording by phone chapter 22 of manners for men this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Campbell Shelp. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 22. Manner. It would not be easy to overestimate the importance of a good manner from a social point of view. It ranks far above much more important qualities, the rough diamonds who conceal their traditional good heart under a surly exterior are seldom happy people, notwithstanding their genuine thoroughness and real goodness. In family life and in society a gentle manner covers a multitude of sins. The world and the home reflect back to us the face we present to them. If we cultivate a bright and cordial manner we shall be heartily received by others, though the real nature of us lies beneath as cold and hard as salt fresh from a mine. In the home the coldness and hardness are soon found out, but they are partially condoned for the sake of the superficial courtesy and kindness. In society the quality of the heart matters little, so long as the surface is, at the same time, genial and polished. Life is chiefly made up of small things, and if we learn to take an interest in the trifling incidents of our friends' lives, 
in the everyday occurrences in the existence of our acquaintances, we supply the sympathetic element that tells so largely in our favor. And very often the simulation of this interest induces the reality, and our own life is brightened by participating in the pleasures and the happiness of others, and deepened by sharing in their disappointments, and by doing so helping them to overcome them. With a cold, forbidding manner it is impossible to convey any such impression. But this often comes from shyness, not only in the young, but all through life. The youthful form of shyness is self-consciousness and self-distrust. That which lasts through life is the fear of self-revelation. Even the frankest natures have often this quality of reticence, which forbids them to reveal the inner depths of their thoughts, and makes them hate to be divined. Rotifacald says we all hate to be divined, though we like to divine others, but many of us know well what a delightful thing it is to be read like an open book by those whose thoughts reflect our own, and with whom we discover ourselves to be in mental kinship. The ideal life is that which has few friends but many acquaintances. The friends are close and firm ones, grappled to our hearts with hooks of steel, and the circle of acquaintances offers opportunities for adding to their number. But without an agreeable manner it is difficult to secure these inner and outer spheres of social companionship. Were I asked to give a recipe for the formation of a good manner, I should recommend an equal mixture of self-confidence and humility as the first essential, then a considerable desire to please, tempered by the self-respect which preserves from officiousness and that annoying air of ingratiating themselves that some men assume in society. There must be perfect self-possession, though in the very young this is scarcely expected, a little becoming shyness sitting very well upon them. I like a shy man, he's getting so scarce said a very pretty woman at a ball not long since. Find one quick and introduce him. Her laughing emissaries went off to search for the desired article, and after a while returned with the report that the only shy man in the room was engaged for every dance. When self-possession has been acquired, it is well to add on to it the saving grace of gentleness. This quality is much misunderstood by men. In women they adore it, in themselves and each other they undervalue it. But women love gentleness in men. It is a most telling piece of the necessary equipment for society. A gentle manner, a gentle voice, and the absence of all self-assertion, that is at the root of the matter, having won more love than good looks. Carlyle called the members of upper-class society amiable stoics, in reference to the equable serenity of countenance and calm self-possession of manner which with they accept those occasionally trying conditions of social life which necessitate self-denial in matters great and small. This placidity is the result of long training. Not just at first does a young man bow to the decree of his hostess which separates him from the girl he admires and tells him off to take some uninteresting dowager to the support room. But should he evince any sign of discontent with the arrangement he is at once convicted of ill-breeding. The man of perfect manners is he who is calmly courteous in all circumstances, as attentive outwardly to the plain and the elderly as he is to the young and the pretty. It is difficult to renounce the delightful tete-a-tete -tete with a charming girl when asked by his hostess to dance with some poor wallflower who has been neglected for half a dozen dances, but it has to be borne, and eventually it brings its own reward. The duty dance is a hard thing, and good manners involve a considerable amount of self-denial, but repetition soon makes it comparatively easy, and invitations of an agreeable kind pour in on the young man who shows himself willing to practice these peculiar forms of selflessness, opportunities for which so frequently arise in society. It is probably an imitation of the surface equanimity that the wooden stair has been adopted so universally by our golden youth. This is useful for wearing at one's club or in the stall of a theatre, and it at once stamps the proprietor of the stair as being in it. The fashion is not confined to England, it reigns in New York, and even in far Australia there is a select coterie of golden or gilded youth who are beginning to learn how to abstract every atom of expression from the countenance, and to look on vacantly or seem to do. As yet, there is no considerable expertness achieved in the matter in antipodean circles, but in New York a very fair impression of imbecility is conveyed in the look of the ultra-fashionable young man. There are various other important matters on which a transatlantic authority has been instructing the youth of his generation. The one involving the most serious responsibility is connected with carrying a cane or stick, as it is better form to call it. 
it must be left at home when going to business, to church, or to make calls. The idea of the latter prohibition is that, if a call is made on a lady, cane in hand, the inference would be that the caller is on sufficiently intimate terms to look on her casually at any time. There is certainly subtlety in this view. It is well that the novice should be made aware that the lowest depth of vulgarity is touched by carrying an umbrella in a case. It is also an important item of information that the gloves and cane must be carried in the same hand. To do otherwise is seriously to err in social forms. Our instructor declares that to attend oratorios and philharmonic, and philharmonic concerts is thoroughly bad form, indicating a tendency to be pedantic. It is much better to go to a horse show. It is by no means considered correct to shake hands. The proper way is to take hold of the fingers of one's acquaintance at the second joints and bestow upon them one or two decisive little jerks, as though testing their strength. No, I thank you, is a form of words no longer heard in good society, having some time since been replaced by no thanks. No man with any claim to social position would consent to pronounce the G at the end of the present participle of verbs. Come in and go in are the correct forms now. Don't you know is ridiculously correct. Men of perception do not care to be more accurate than others of their set. Don't you know is more customary, and the pronunciation marks the man as riding on the topmost crest of the social wave. There must be a staccato sound about the phase, which alternates pleasantly with the languid drawl. The latter is still in favor and accompanies admirably the studied lack of animation in the expression and general wooden look of the face to revert for a moment to the cane or walking stick. There is much to be deduced from the manner in which it is carried. The correct style is to hold it at an angle of forty-five degrees, with the ferrule upmost and forward. This is the sort of thing that no man could possibly discover for himself. The natural man would incline to carry his stick in such fashion as would tend to direct its point to the ground. This unsophisticated mode would at once reveal him as uninitiated in the minor morals of good manners. The latest mode of arranging the male hair, as practiced in New York, and possibly nearer home as well, is worth noting. First it is made thoroughly wet, then brushed and parted, after which the head is swathed with linen bands, which are kept on until the hair is thoroughly dry. This method produces the plastered appearance which is now recognized as good form. The cordiality of manner is rapidly becoming obsolete, and is utterly condemned by all who have studied the subject, yet it is a recognized fact that amiability has now superseded sarcasm, and the up-to-date young man practices a careless superficial benevolence of pronouncing every woman charming and every man a good fellow. The scathing satiric wit of the last century was as the nadir to the zenith of appreciative recognition of the best that is in every human being. It is pleasant to be able to add to all this minute detail about little superficialities that the young man of today is a vast improvement on his predecessors in very many ways. Swearing is out of fashion. Getting intoxicated is decidedly low, and those who disgrace themselves in this way are soon cut by their acquaintance. Some twenty years since things were very different. To get tipsy was regarded as a proof of manliness. To wrench off door-knockers and play similar senseless pranks was considered a form of wit, and the heroes of such performances were looked on with admiring eyes by their companions. In many ways a higher standard now reigns. The pictures of ballet dancers that used once to adorn a young man's rooms have given place to others of a higher class. Dissolute and unprincipled men get the cold shoulder from others of their set, and vice, thank heaven, is thoroughly out of fashion. There is still plenty of folly. It is inseparable from youth. But in matters of more moment, there has been immense improvement going steadily on for many years. There are young men who mistake arrogance of manners for self-possession, and who conduct themselves when in society with lifted chin and a haughty air that may accord very well with their own estimate of themselves, but seem rather out of place to onlookers. Such a man invites comparisons between his social deserts and his implied conviction of superiority. He may take in a few inexperienced girls and young fellows of adolescent inability of judgment, but even these triumphs are short-lived, and he is set down as a pompous ass, to use the young man's phrase for describing him. It is good manners to articulate distinctly, and bad manners to neglect to do so. A man need not exactly take lessons in elocution, though they would not be amiss, 
but he can teach himself to pronounce clearly and use the tone of voice that is best suited to the various occasions when he converses. A breathy voice is extremely disagreeable. The syllables come out enveloped in sort of a windy roar. This is owing to a wrong way of breathing, and it can easily be cured, with advantage to the health as well as the personality. A very confidential tone is always used by some men when they speak to a woman. If they merely hope your gown did not get muddy, they look into one's eyes and murmur like any sucking dove. But if their articulation is indistinct, they are quite a nuisance. One has to ask them to repeat themselves, and the nonsense they talk shows up very badly in an encore. But when they enunciate clearly, their devoted murmuring sometimes take very well. It is not until a woman has seen three or four others besides herself approached in the same afternoon or evening with similar devout and prayer-like whispering that she begins to value this particularly at its true worth. With reference to the word fellow, a subtle distinction or two must be drawn. In lowly circles a young man is called a fellow, young men fellows. So it is in good society, but with a distinct difference. It is not very easy to make this difference clear. Young men of good position refer very commonly to others in their acquaintance as the fellows, but they would not use the word to describe young men generally. Women young and old of the lower classes speak of young men generally as fellows, but gentlewomen never do so. A lady never uses the expression, a girl and a fellow. At the same time, she may frequently speak of young fellows. I am aware that there was a want of clearness in all of this, but it is a matter among many others that can only be acquired by being accustomed to the usages of good society. The autocrat of the breakfast table said in one of his books that if he heard a woman pronounce the word how, he learned more about her in an instant than a third person could tell him in an hour. If she called it how, she revealed herself as belonging to the uncultured classes. In the same way, if a girl were to say, I met a fellow yesterday, she would unconsciously make a similar self-revelation. A young man would make an equal mistake if he were to speak of my sister's fellow. But he would be correct enough if he were to say, the fellow my sister's engaged to. These little nuances of expression remind one of the old rhyme. Strange that such difference should be twixt Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Though small talk is as indispensable in social life as pennies and halfpennies in the transactions of everyday existence, we must also have conversational gold and silver at our command if we wish to be successful. When the preliminaries of acquaintanceship are over, there is no necessity to keep up the commonplaces of small talk. To do so is rather insulting to women. To be talked down to is always aggravating, especially when one feels a conviction that the person who is thus affably stooping for one's benefit belongs in reality to a lower intellectual plane than one's own. At the same time, many young men with nothing in them are socially successful, being possessed of those superficial qualities and that outward polish which are, for the purposes of everyday intercourse, more useful than abysmal personal depths. Was it Goethe or Schiller who said that for domestic utility a farthing candle is more useful than all the stars of heaven? A light playfulness of fancy, combined with the gentleness that carefully avoids wounding even the smallest, is a high recommendation in society, but to be forever laughing is wearisome in the extreme to the spectators. I make no apology for quoting here the following passages from Mr. Brown's letters to a young man about town from a punch of 1849. Mr. Brown was Thackeray, I believe. He says, I beseech and implore you to make a point of being intimate with one or two families where you can see kind and well-bred English ladies. I have seen women of all nations in the world, but I never saw the equals of English women, meaning, of course, to include our cousins the Mackworders of Glasgow and the O'Toole's of Cork, and I pray sincerely, my boy, that you may always have a woman for a friend. It is better for you to pass an evening once or twice a week in a lady's drawing room, even though the conversation is rather slow and you know the girls' songs by heart, than in a club, tavern, or smoking room, or pit of a theatre. Remember, if a house is pleasant and you like to remain in it, that to be well with the women of the house is the great, the vital point. If it is a good house, don't turn up your nose because you are only asked to come in the evening, while others are invited to dine. Recollect the debts of dinners which a hospitable family has to pay. Who are you that you should always be expecting to nestle under the mahogany? Agreeable acquaintances are made just as well in the drawing room as in the dining room. Go to tea brisk and good humored. Be determined to be pleased. Talk to a dowager. Take a hand at whist. 
If you are musical and know a song, sing it like a man. Never sulk about dancing, but off with you. You will find your acquaintance enlarge. Mothers pleased with your good humor will probably ask you to Pocklington Square to a little party. You will get on, you will form yourself a circle. You may marry a rich girl or, at any rate, get the chance of seeing a number of the kind and the pretty. The dressing, the clean gloves, and cab hire are nuisances, I grant you. The idea of the party itself is a bore, but you must go. When you are at the party, it is not so stupid. There is always something pleasant for the eye and attention of an observant man. End of chapter 22「Chapter twenty three of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Broda. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter twenty three In Church. I know a young man who makes it a practice to arrive late in church every Sunday. I often wish that he did not go to my church for he makes me cordially despise him, thus disturbing the calm and quiet of the proper frame of mind for Sundays. I conclude that he likes to be looked at, though why he should do so is not apparent. It is in fact not only rude but irreverent to be late in church for the beginning of the service. If one should be accidentally late, it is good manners to wait till the congregation rises from the kneeling posture before making one's way to a seat. It is almost an awful thing to interrupt a prayer, but I have seen people do it with no more scruple than if they were passing in a crowded street. Eighteen inches are the measurement of space allowed to each sitter in churches. In some it may be more, in others it may be less, but I have reason to believe that this is the average. Now, if any man of extra size should find himself in a pew with other persons, he must, in common courtesy, keep himself as well within the limits of eighteen inches as the width of his shoulders will allow but i have occasionally seen quite slim young men sprawl far beyond the frontier lines lounging is a habit of the day and there are men who get themselves into marvellously corkscrew attitudes in church as elsewhere fidgety men are more so in church than anywhere else they seem to find it impossible to keep still sometimes they even produce a cough wherewith to amuse themselves though they are not troubled with it at any other time the charm of a reposeful manner is denied to them reverence for the sacred place conduces to a quiet manner but this is not always felt by those who attend public worship the conventional idea seems to be that such assemblies are merely phases of social life that it is respectable to be seen there and that the service and the sermon are things to be worried through in deference to a prevalent idea that they form part of an institution that is generally regarded as excellent the small minority are those who regard church services in their true light as lifting the thoughts above earthly things and yet by no means unfitting them for earth where for instance could a better law of good manners be found than in the book of books a glance at the end of the fourth chapter of Ephesians will show a code of conduct that, if followed, would make a man a perfect member of society. End of chapter 23. Recording by Jen Broda. Chapter 24 of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Campbell Shelp. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 24. Correspondence. It is impolite to leave letters unanswered for several days, especially if the writers are ladies, or, if men, superior in age or station. Notes of invitation should be replied to within 24 hours. Plain white cream-laid notepaper and envelopes should be used, the latter either square or wallet-shaped, but never of the oblong, narrow shape peculiar to business correspondence. The address on the notepaper should be embossed or printed in simple characters, over-ornament being in the worst taste. If the writer is entitled to use a crest, it should be produced as simply as possible, with or without the family motto, and free from the glow of varied color in which some men and women delight. 
There are letters whose devices in scarlet and gold are strangely in contrast with the meagre and disappointing character of their contents. They make one think of fried sprats served up on a gold entree dish. The writing should be clear, neat, and legible. The ink black. In beginning a letter with sir or madam, the omission of the name is remedied by inscribing it in the left-hand corner at the bottom of the note. In commercial correspondence, it seems to be the rule to put the name of the addressee just above, dear sir or madam. Should it be advisable to enclose in any letter an envelope for a reply, ready addressed, it is not good form to put Esquire after one's own name in addressing it. Married women and widows are not addressed by their own Christian names, but by those of their husbands. For instance, no one versed in social forms would write Mrs. Mary Smith, but Mrs. John Smith. Widows of titles men have their Christian name put before their surname thus. Laura Lady Letting, Maria Marchioness of Addisbury, Georgina Viscountess Medway, Mary Duchess of Blankton. The unmarried daughters of dukes, marquises, and earls have their Christian name invariably inserted between their courtesy title and the surname, as Lady Mary Baker. When married, they retain this form, only substituting the husband's surname for their own, as Lady Mary Garth. But if their husband should be a peer, they merge their courtesy title in his. The third person in correspondence is falling considerably into disuse, and presenting compliments is almost obsolete. Invitations of a formal kind and their replies are couched in the third person, but for purposes of correspondence with strangers, it is almost always better to use the first person. The exception is in replying to a letter written in the third person, when it is in better taste to reply in the same way. The third person is also used in writing to tradespeople. Mr. Edlicott will feel obliged if Mr. Jones will kindly call on Thursday morning with reference to some repairs. In this case, the reply would be written in the first person. Letters of introduction, says La Fontaine, are drafts that must be cashed at sight. They are sometimes difficult to write, especially if they have been asked for, not volunteered. They are always left unsealed, but should there be circumstances about the person introduced which the other party should know, it is well to communicate them in a private letter, which should be dispatched so as to arrive before the letter of introduction is presented. Anyone receiving a letter of introduction would immediately take steps to show some attention to the individual introduced. The usual thing is to ask him to dinner, if he is a social equal, to offer his services, if he should be a superior, and to ascertain in what way one can be useful to him, if he is an inferior. A personal call must precede all invitations. This is a fixed and rigid rule, the exception being in the case of persons presenting their own letters of introduction, as is usually done. But should the person to whom they are addressed be out, the formal call must follow. All ladies from the Queen downwards are addressed in beginning a letter as Madam, all gentlemen from the highest to the lowest as Sir. Tradesmen, however, begin Your Royal Highness, your grace or your ladyship, in writing to their titled employers. They also address their letters quite differently, as will be seen from the following instructions. Addresses of letters. Her Majesty the Queen, to His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, to Her Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. The same form is used in addressing communications to all other members of the royal family, adding the title where the word prince or princess would be incorrect as to His Royal Highness the Duke of York, to Her Royal Highness the Duchess of York. Below the rank of royalty there is the distinction between the letters addressed by persons on an equality with those to whom formal and they write, and by inferiors. I shall call them formal and informal, and range them in separate lines. Informal. Formal. The Duke of blank, to His Grace the Duke of blank. The Duchess of blank, to Her Grace the Duchess of blank. The Marquis of blank, to the Most Honorable the Marquis of blank. The Marchioness of blank, to the Most Honorable the Marchioness of blank. The Earl of blank, to the Right Honorable the Earl of blank. The Countess of blank, to the Right Honorable the Countess of blank. The Viscount blank, the Right Honorable the Viscount blank. The Viscountess blank, the Right Honorable the Viscountess blank. Lord blank, the Right Honorable Lord blank or Baron, blank. 
Lady Blank, the Right Honourable Lady Blank or Baroness Blank. Members of the Privy Council are also addressed as Right Honourable in the same way as peers. In this case, the names of commoners are not followed by the abbreviation Esquire, as the Right Honourable James Balfour, MP. Ambassadors and their wives are addressed as His Excellency, Her Excellency, the personal and official titles following the word as to His Excellency the Earl of Blank, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to France, to Her Excellency the Countess of Blank. Other official personages are addressed in the following way. To His Excellency Lord Blank, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, to His Grace the Archbishop of Blank, the Right Reverend the Bishop of Blank, the Very Reverend the Dean of Blank. Academical distinctions are indicated by the initials placed after the name, LLD for Doctor of Laws and Learning, DD for Doctor of Divinity, and so on. So much for the envelopes, the proper way to begin letters is as follows. As I have mentioned, the Queen is addressed as Madam in the inside of a letter. A gentleman writing to the Queen would sign himself, I have the honor to submit myself with profound respect, Your Majesty's most devoted subject and servant. Above the word Madam should be written, Her Majesty the Queen. Lord Beaconsfield struck out a line of his own, and in writing to the Queen began, Mr. Disraeli, continuing in the third person and addressing Her Majesty in the second. The Prince of Wales is addressed as Sir, above this word being written, to His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Persons on intimate terms sometimes begin Sir or Dear Prince, others My Dear Prince. The Princess of Wales is occasionally addressed by friends as My Dear Princess. The two orthodox endings to such letters are respectively Your Royal Highness's Dutiful and Obedient Servant, or a humbler style, Your Royal Highness's Dutiful and Most Obedient Servant. To all other royal princes and princesses, the ending would be Most Humble and Obedient Servant. Dukes other than royal are addressed inside letters by intimates as Dear Duke, by others My Lord Duke, may it please your grace. In writing to a duchess, her title is placed above the madam. In formal letters, marquise would be addressed as my lord marquis. A very common form of mistake is that of omitting the Christian name from the courtesy titles of the sons and daughters of dukes, marquises, and earls. The sons have the title lord prefixed to the Christian and surname, for instance, Lord Alfred Osborne, Lord Henry Somerset. It is extremely incorrect to call either of these Lord Osborne or Lord Somerset. The daughters of dukes, marquises, and earls have the title lady before their Christian and surname. Lady Emily Heneage, for instance, must not be addressed as Lady Heneage. Should she marry a commoner, only the surname is altered. The Lady Emily remains. This may all appear a little involved to those unaccustomed to titles, but neglect of these forms indicates very clearly a lack of savoir-faire. It is a source of great annoyance to the owners of courtesy titles to have the Christian name omitted. Anybody, even a knight's wife, may be a Lady Smith or Jones. The insertion of the Christian name before the Smith or Jones means that the possessor is the daughter of a duke, marquis, or earl. In beginning a letter to any of the above, a stranger would say, Dear Lady Mary Smith. But the usual form would be, Dear Lady Mary. Inferiors would begin by writing the lady's title over the word Madam, or merely beginning Madam and writing the title at the end of the letter. In writing to an ambassador or his wife, the title is placed above the word sir or madam. Inferiors would write, may it please your excellency, and would conclude with, I have the honor to be your excellency's most humble, obedient servant. In writing to an archbishop, a correspondent would begin, your grace, ending, I remain your grace's most obedient servant. To a bishop, the form would be, my lord, or right reverend sir, or may it please your lordship the last being, of course, the humblest form of address. The conclusion would be, I remain, my lord, or right reverend sir, your most obedient servant. The beginning of a letter to a dean would be, reverend sir, or Mr. Dean, the title of all these dignitaries, being, in formal letters, indicted above the beginning. Those having slight acquaintance would begin, dear Mr. Dean. Strangers would end the letter, I have the honor to be your most obedient servant. Doctors of Divinity are addressed as Reverend Sir, as well as Archdeacons and all other clergy. Intimates would begin letters to the above with Dear Archbishop, Dear Bishop, Dear Dean, or Dear Doctor. With the sole exception of lieutenants in the army, all officers have their military rank prefixed to their name. 
and signs and lieutenants are addressed as Esquire. In the Navy, admirals of the flag, white, blue, or red, are addressed as the Honorable, this being prefixed to the name. Otherwise, a letter would begin Sir and end, I remain, Sir, your obedient servant. Commodores, captains, and lieutenants in the Navy are all addressed in the same way. End of chapter 24「Chapter twenty five of Manners for Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter twenty five Personal Speech with Royalty and Rank. It is sometimes difficult to know how to address personally people of high rank. The queen is addressed as ma'am by those immediately surrounding her person and by princesses, duchesses, and others who are on terms that may be described as those of acquaintanceship with her majesty. All others would speak to her as your majesty. The princess of Wales and all other princesses are in the same way addressed as ma'am, or your royal highness, according to the position of the person speaking to them. The prince of Wales, with all other royal dukes and princes, is addressed as sir, or your royal highness. The duke of Teck as your serene highness, as well as many foreign princes. Equals would address all these as prince. The following list will show the correct modes of addressing the nobility informally and formally, in conversation, the first being the custom among acquaintances, the latter by all others. Duke, informal, duke, formal, your grace. Duchess, informal, duchess, formal, your grace. Marquis, informal, Lord A, formal, my lord or your lordship. Marchioness, informal, Lady A, formal, my lady or your ladyship. Earl, informal, Lord B, formal, my lord or your lordship. Countess, informal, Lady B, formal, my lady or your ladyship. Viscount, informal, Lord C, formal, my lord or your lordship. Viscountess, informal, Lady C, formal, my lady or your ladyship. Baron, informal, Lord D, formal, my lord or your lordship. Baroness, informal, Lady D, formal, my lady or your ladyship. It is one of the rules of etiquette that, in speaking with royal persons, the inferior leaves it to them to originate subjects of conversation, and never introduces any topic of his own. Letters of condolence are among the most difficult forms of composition. They are almost equally trying to read and to write. The best rule to be given for these is to make them as brief as possible. If brevity is the soul of wit, it is also, in such cases, the very heart of sympathy. A very usual fault committed is to begin by dilating upon the shock or grief felt by the writer. The absurdity of this becomes apparent when one compares mentally the shock or grief as felt by the recipient. Two lines conveying the expression of sympathy are better than pages of even the most eloquent composition. Mourners require all their fortitude at times of loss, and anything likely to impair their self-command is the reverse of a kindness. On hearing or reading of the death of an acquaintance or friend, an expression of sympathy should at once be sent off. It used to be the custom to wait for the memoriam cards sent out by the family, but this, if it was ever the custom in the best society, has now long ceased to be so. Memoriam cards are only used in humble circles. 
at the same time one needs to be very careful as to the accuracy of one's information before sending off a letter of condolence similarity of name is apt to lead to awkward mistakes in this connection it may be as well to remark that about a week after the funeral it is customary to call and leave cards of inquiry when these are responded to by cards of thanks for inquiries it is a sign that the family is willing to receive callers end of chapter twenty five recording by phone end of manners for men by mrs humphrey chapter four of manners for men this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Broda. Manners for Men by Mrs. Humphrey. Chapter 4. In a Hansom. In handing a lady into a hansom, care must be taken to protect her dress from the muddy wheel. The gentleman asks if she would like the glasses down, and conveys her instructions to the driver, then raises his hat as she drives away. Should he be accompanying her in the hansom, she seats herself at the nearest side to the pavement, so that when he enters he will not have to go round a corner, as it were. In this case he gives the cabman instructions across the roof of the cab, and if his companion wishes the glasses to be lowered, he asks for them through the trap-door at the top of the cab. He must never smoke when the glasses are let down. To do so would render the atmosphere unbearable to almost any woman. But if he knows his partner in the drive sufficiently well, he can ask permission to smoke, should the glasses not be required. End of chapter 4 Recording by Jen Broda